But they couldn't be there in 48 for the launch of that super guy. Or in 62 for the launch of that spider guy. But they can be there now for the birth of the Ultraverse. Whoa. Live that way. Ah! Hard case, first editions in comic shops, June 16th. Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's the brain of the mainframe here, Niall Scala, and I'm very excited because this is exclusive. The first Ultraverse panel that we're going to have here tonight on Pop XP. So everyone, thank you for joining joining in. And my special guest tonight is Mr. JC Vaughn. JC, how you doing? Hey, Niall, what's going on, man? Not too much, man. I'm very excited. We are here for our first panel. It's pretty exciting. It's it's a uh, it's a panel we've done actually live uh, at the San Diego Comic Con. Uh, it was done at WonderCon before I joined it, and then we've done two years at San Diego, and it's gone over really well. And it is the history of the Malibu Ultraverse. Oh, this is exciting. I grew up with the, the Ultraverse comics Malibu. Um, when you were telling me about this and you brought this to me, I was like, oh my god, this is great. We have to do this, and this has to be our first panel. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really excited that it's first too, because these guys were really instrumental in me uh, mm -hmm. getting my start in the business too. So I'm really excited about that. I re I am I'm still a fan of the stuff that they they did back then, and they are really cool individuals as uh, as they were. You want to start bringing them out? Yeah, let's start rolling in our guests. All right, first we've got Dave Ulbrich, who is the former publisher of Malibu. Hello, Dave. Welcome, Dave. Hi, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Oh. We've got Tom Mason, the former creative director. Hi, everyone. And Hello, most Tom. importantly, cre creator of Dinosaurs for Hire, most importantly. <laughs> um, and Chris Alm, the editor-in-chief of the Ultraverse and writer of Rune with uh, Barry Winsersmith. Fantastic. Chris, thank you for coming on. Uh, oh, Dave, great. Tom, this is exciting. Just so you guys know, you are our first panel, our virtual panel here on our series Pop XP. And it's definitely an honor and a privilege to have you guys on. I wore my best shirt. It's I think it looks like you ironed it too. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he uses I, the spray. You just spray it and then you tug. <laughs> I, I have a lot of free time in the quarantine period. <laughs> as do we all. As do we it's all. A, it's a it's a privilege to be here, but I gotta ask what all the viewers are gonna be asking if this is your first broadcast. What is Pop XP? I mean, what does Pops, XP stand for? Why XP? It, ex, it stands the for the experience. Ooh, so nice. you know. We, we started off as crowdfunding comics uh, yep. with my co-host, Billy Tucci, and we really focused on indie creators and crowdfunded books and things like that. But what was happening is we've, we both have so many friends in the industry and people want to come on. It's like, oh man, but I don't have a crowdfunding book, right? So it's like, hmm. All right, so we're now, you know, over 130 episodes. Uh, we're like, oh, you know what? Maybe it's time to expand and rebrand. So we took a channel, which was Crowdfunding Comics, and we made it just a show. And and now the the actual channel is Pop XP, which is the pop culture experience, because we have friends in, in the action figure line, you know, designing toys, making toys. We have, you know, actors and actress friends, uh, uh, directors, producers, comic creators, animators. So now we're just encompassing all of them and bringing into this channel. And then what's cool about this, too, is we can even bring up the stuff that was popular in the past. I'm going to do a whole episode on just slap bracelets, if you remember nice. those. <laughs> remember slap bracelets. For one hour, I'm just going to go, bam. They're See? still cool, aren't they? Map. They are still cool. They still exist, if you look Don't, hard enough. The uh, uh, Ross Ritchie at Boom gave a bunch away at uh, San Diego a couple years ago, and my kids still have them. There's, that's great. They, 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 they transcend millions. the ages. Look, they're not pogs, but they're cool still. <laughs> Which should be coming back. That's my that's my vote. We need pogs back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How long were pogs popular? About 14 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was like a blink. <laughs> Just, I had them and then I didn't. <laughs> Just long enough for everybody to produce some. So about yep. nine months. <laughs> That's it was too great. expensive to make trading cards. So he said, let's just cut little circles in them. <laughs> and then someone said, hey, let's hit them with a metal thing. And uh, there you go. Brilliant. But without further ado, JC, this is uh, you, you are the honorary host of this panel. All right. And well, uh, I'm going to turn the show over to you. Let's uh, let's uh, open up with the let's open up with this slide. Uh, we've got a really nice presentation that was based on the one that originally appeared at WonderCon. We edited it for San Diego and I think we edited it the next year again too, when it was just pretty much Dave and me. Uh, San Diego, we had a huge turnout with with just so many Ultraverse people there. It was just absolutely incredible. Uh, and 
the great thing about the Ultraverse to me is that from that San Diego experience, I got to know a lot of the people in the Facebook group, and it's a growing group, uh, as witnessed by the number of questions that get asked over and over and over, which is probably <laughs> something we'll go into too. Dave, talk talk a bit about this slide, because I think Wes Craven, it, when, when we start talking Ultraverse founders, people don't know his involvement. Uh, Tom tells the story way better than I do, so I'll All probably right, turn over to him, but okay. well, go ahead. Okay, so um, when we started to put together the list of uh, people that we wanted to bring in as the Ultraverse founders, um, we gravitated towards uh, comic book people. So Engelhardt, Hudnall, that kind of people, those kind of people. And um, we also had, uh, through the company, we had a showbiz agent in Hollywood who worked at ICM. Um, and um, I forget her name, but who cares? Um, <laughs> and so... Um, Sure, Scott. Her family does. It's a, <laughs> her <laughs> no, children no, probably no, care. No, maybe, maybe she's de maybe she's dead now. Nobody cares. Um, and so, um, Jesus Christ! Did I did I go too dark? I went too dark, didn't I? No, not at all. Okay. No. And and so um, and Scott used to talk to her like every couple of weeks, and um, was talking about the Ultraverse. And Wes Craven's name came up, and um, Scott said, "Hey, what if we got a guy like Wes Craven who's really good at creating?" villainous characters that sort of resonate with a large audience. And I, I think we took like what, two, three seconds before we said yes. If, if um, that long, if we that, were, I was a Wes Craven yeah. fan. Yeah. So, and so easy call. And so Wes yeah. Craven was, um, uh, he, his people talked to our people and the deals were made and he was interested and he was into it. And he was actually booked for the flight from LA to Scottsdale for the original Ultraverse Founders Conference. Um, and, um, and and according to, and it was, <laughs> according to his assistant, uh, Mr. Craven only flies first class. Um, and um, that it, there was no first class seating on the plane, but I don't think that actually, now I've gone way off topic, haven't I? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> And so um, I didn't say anything. <laughs> and so the whatever the day was before the flights to Scottsdale were to take place, uh, Wes called up and said, "Well, I I can't go. I can't be a part of it. I just got the green light to make a movie." And so he had to bow out to actually go make a movie. And the funny part of the story is, the movie deal fell through, so it never happened. So he didn't actually make a movie. Well. But we still got that lovely quote from him. It was so. a great quote. Yes, All right. Yeah. So, so on to the next slide. All right. This is the thing that I'd like any, any of you guys that want to comment about this. Malibu, and we'll get into some of the individual comics, but explain the organization of Malibu because it seemed to me that you guys had like 453 imprints, and I don't quite know <laughs> how that happened. Well, like like all like all. Like, well, like the Marvel Universe, as a matter of fact, it was very organic. You're going along doing one thing, you think it's gonna that's a good idea, that's the great plan, and then you get this other opportunity. You're like, oh, hmm, should we do that? Okay, let's do that. Well, then, how do we integrate that in what we're doing? Oh, that would make help our creators make more money. Let's do that. So then you get another opportunity and like, okay, how do you integrate that? And then like, okay, then you got to look at the marketplace and the marketplace goes, how do, why do we care if it's an eternity or an air cell book? So then we have to start figuring out like how you're going to define the lines. And then one line doesn't really work the way you want it to. So then you got to change it. And that's how you end up with, I mean, it was, it was very organic. It was just like, we're rolling along. We're making the best decisions as we can. And it mm -hmm. seems like every six months or nine months, the world would change and, we would adjust. We, we, and, and we also started Malibu during during the comic book bust, the black and white bust. Yeah. So um, we were we were a bit traumatized by that. So we were very very like on the ground. What do we do next? How do we figure out the next the, the 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 next thing? And how do we do things that are different from the way the rest of the industry is going? So that we could, uh, you know, differentiate ourselves. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's interesting. It, it's sort of like if you look at if you look at um, pre Bill Gaines EC. Uh, and immediately after he takes over the company, you see them trying to figure out the trends that are working, what's working, yeah. trying all this different stuff before they settle on horror and science fiction. 
and it's a little bit of you guys were sort of doing something similar. I think this might be a good place to sort of pause for a minute and talk each of you about how you came to Malibu and what your background was to that point. And why don't we start with you, Chris? <laughs> so, so I came to Malibu, uh, started by uh, painting miniatures in a game store while I was going to college. And I met a good friend of mine named, named Paul O'Connor, and we were both rabid comic book fans. And I started working for this game store who ended up having a distributorship of, uh, of, of selling games. So I decided to help the distributorship. And then Scott Rosenberg reached out to me and, you know, plucked me from that particular place to run his game company. And Dave probably has a story about that from, from his point of view. And that's where I met Dave. And both of us, you know, instantly sort of uh, bonded. Well, actually, Dave just scared the crap out of me all the time because we had to get there really, really early. And I was kind of a scared guy anyway. Like, I don't like watching horror movies or anything like that. And Dave would be there at five in the morning because he'd always, I don't know why, he never slept or whatever. And he'd be there behind boxes and stuff and turn off all the lights as soon as I walked into the warehouse. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, and then leap out at me. And he thought it was really funny the first like fifty times. It was pretty funny, <laughs> but then after that, it got uh, it got it got pretty sad. So yeah, that, and that's how I came to meet Dave. And then, and then Dave uh, will tell his part of the story and wrote me in. And that's where I met Tom. And then uh, you know we all kind of formed that uh, that that trio from there. Dave, um, I was working with Tom at Fantagraphics, and Fantagraphics moved from. Connecticut to California and I was a young about to be father and couldn't afford to work at Fantagraphics anymore. Uh, I went to work at Sunrise Distribution, which is where I met Chris for, for Scott Rosenberg. Um, and I was there when Watchmen came out. I was there helping retailers pick out copies when Dark Dead came out. Um, so I was help. I was basically customer service. And at one point, Scott was having a pizza night after we distributed all the comics and he looked at me and he said what do you want to be doing in five years and I said well I think I'd like to be publishing comics again mostly because I think that except for Marvel and DC we you know somebody that was paying attention could do a lot better mm -hmm. and a week later two weeks later something like that Scott said great figure out what you want to call it if you'll run it I'll pay for it Oh, wow. And I, I don't think I don't think it was six out. I think it was less than six hours later. I had Tom on the phone saying, let's go. Let's do this thing. We're, we're, we've got some funding. Let's, <laughs> let's my, dad's got a barn. Let's make a let's put on a show. <laughs> um, and so that's always that been was, your pitch, Dave. <laughs> that was that was the birth of Malibu Comics. And on the I was I was struggling for a name and. Uh, I was driving down the 101 freeway, and between my house and Sunrise is an exit called Malibu Canyon. And I thought, Malibu, and I kept thinking, Malibu, it's got the right number of letters. And one of the things I was always adamant about is I didn't want the name of a comic book company, something that made unnecessary promises. So not to pick on them, but I thought Innovation Comics was a horrible name for a comic book company. Because you put out one that's not innovative, and that's the headline. Yeah. yeah. Right. Hot comics. Right. First comics was good because it didn't really promise anything, but it also had that thing. Right. But yeah. anyway, I, I settled on Malibu because it centered us as a California company and it had about the right number of letters and it was easy to pronounce. Everybody knew what it meant and, and uh, it didn't make unnecessary silly promises mm -hmm. anyway, as part of the name of the company. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Tom. <laughs> What Dave just called me up, said, "Hey, come on, we gotta do." Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a sucker for a good pitch that just says, "Hey, you want to come on and make some comic books?" Um, and so we had uh, he he did yeah he called me up. We met for uh, lunch, I think, at Jack in the Box off of Malibu Canyon Road or Canaan Road. And you took me to Jack in the Box. Yeah, wow, <laughs> big spender. And then um, <laughs> you got to go to Coco's. Shut up. And then in about <laughs> what, you took him to Coco's. I only got Jack. In the box. <laughs> and so <laughs> there were time restraints. <laughs> I know. And, and so um, uh, he just asked, and I said, "Yes, let's do that." And then from there, conversation sort of evolved over like three or four months about how we would actually do it. And uh, then in January of '97, we actually got desks and chairs. 
How long, how long till you started producing stuff? Uh, January 87, we started looking for stuff. And then the first books were what, June 87? June, yeah. June, June yeah. 87 were the first releases. Libby Ellis mm -hmm. and Stealth Force and Dark Wolf. Yes. Let, now, now let's go on to another slide here. I think we've got some of the images of the... Uh, some well, of the just early. really quick before we move sure. on, um, yeah. just because I'm seeing here with the whole, you know, the, the image, you know, Malibu Comics and Image. Sure. Um, I mean, were you guys prepared for what happened in 92? Like, did you guys know things were going to blow up like that? Nobody was prepared for what was going to happen in 92. We, we thought I mean, it was, I, we were I, optimistic. We thought it was going right. to everything was going to do well. Yeah. Just wouldn't not that well. Here's here's when we knew what was going to happen, and, and Dave could probably jump in and correct me. Is that we had solicited orders for Young Blood number one uh, by Rob Liefeld, and the orders came in really really well, but the book was late, and we had to send out an emergency resolicitation through the distributors, which is usually the kiss of death. But the orders actually went up by another two hundred thousand copies, and I think, oh, wow. and I think the total for the first issue was like six hundred and forty thousand copies, and so then we thought, oh, this <laughs> this might actually be a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rob, all... was so, Rob was so late, we had to resolicit it twice, if memory serves, and every time it kept going up. And in between resolicits, we'd get a more advanced reorders. I mean, yeah. the writing was on the wall pretty fast. Yeah. Right, and then, and then we would sort of hear from, um, and I'm sure almost any quote attributed to uh, Todd McFarlane or Jim Lee is, is in dispute, but... Um, <laughs> When we got the initial, when we got the numbers from Rob after the resolicitation, what we heard through Jim and Todd was, "Oh, we can beat that." <laughs> and so, and so then Spawn came out, and then Wildcats came out, and they did. Their their numbers were even higher than what Youngblood number one was. Yeah, it's it was incredible. the timing, right? The, the, yeah, you could have better better timing. Than it's like that it's like a it's like a perfect timing. storm of mm -hmm. those guys were sort of at their at their not creative peak, but sort of at their market value yeah. peak. And yeah. um, they had that big, uh, the thing that everybody loves is that, that giant press moment where you just, you walk out of your corporate job and you start your own company and it's a really good story to tell people and boom. Before it was a mainstream business story too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it had really gone out to, everyone knew about this new thing called comics and collectibles that were big and, you know, that was hitting the stock market too at that time with mm -hmm. Marvel. Yeah. Be before we shipped our first comic, Tom and I saw a proposal that Rob Liefeld sent to us for Youngblood. So this would have been sometime in early 1987. Yes. We saw a team picture of all the young blood characters, a whole bunch of development stuff. And I think there was even a piece in there at, uh, inked by Jerry Ordway of all people. Oh, yeah, wow, I, think, really? I think you're right. I remember you showing it to me in the warehouse. And so we're like, Rob, let's definitely do that. And he said, okay, great. And I'm preparing the contract. And the next thing I know I hear from Rob, he's doing Hawk and Dove. Mm -hmm. We were the first publisher to offer Jim Lee a contract to draw a comic book. But before he could sign it, he got his, you know, Marvel DC deal, whatever. So we were right there um, for the very beginning. And even after Rob started drawing for the big publishers, he would still do guest covers for us. He'd mm -hmm. fit them in wherever he could. So whenever we had a book that we wanted to pop a little bit on the sales, we'd just get Rob to draw the cover. Yep. That's I great. Know, we probably, he probably did, I don't know, what do you think, Tom? Six, ten covers for us? Yeah, I'm gonna get it wrong if I try to guess. So I'll go low. I'll say six. Yeah, but he did a bunch. Yeah, he did a bunch. Right. Of, he did a bunch of covers for us. So we we were friendly yeah. with Rob. And then um, when Rob decided he he'd had enough of editorial interference from mm -hmm. Marvel and DC, and he wanted to do his own thing, God bless him. He wants to do his own thing if he can make money at it. Good for him. Yeah. But he and Hank Canals came up to the office and said. You know, what can we do? And that's when the whole exterminators thing happened and the art of Rob Liefeld. And um, I think I actually came up with the word extreme for him. And then he yes. used it for 30 years or whatever. Maybe he's still using it. That's great. All right. Let's let's hit the next slide. All right. So this is this is this is great because it sort of gives you the framework of before the before the ultraverse started. Now I want to ask a question is you guys at what point did you know that Image was going to be with you guys for a year? Was it just from the outset or was it that, you know, hey, they're going to go their own way. We need to do something to replace it. 
Well, I think I think we always knew from the very beginning that it was not going to last because they didn't they didn't need us for anything except distribution muscle and and printing and sort of getting the books out the door. And so once they figured that out um, and got a little more stable and understood that this was not going to be some sort of fly by night thing, that this actually could be a thing. Um, we felt that they would eventually just jettison us and move on to their own thing. But there wasn't a time. There wasn't a, when we signed the deal. It was open ended. It okay. wasn't yeah. like yeah. It we, we didn't like, think it was going to end it. Either. They didn't yeah. think there, there wasn't a ticking time. Uh, there wasn't a time clock on our deal's going to last years. Like it'll last until it ends. Right. And it just happened to be work out to be about a year because. I got the call from Jim Lee and he says, you know, Dave, we could hire four monkeys to do for us what you do for us. That's very complimentary. Yeah. At least yeah, about four monkeys, probably. but not three. Right. That's it. So, um, and also, um, uh, well, no, I guess no one likes to talk about this, but the image books made a pile of cash. And so yep. our, our 10% take of image really started to add up. And so then there's this moment of, well, what should we do with that stuff? What should we? What should we make? What should we contribute? What should we create? What should we develop? And so, out of that, then came the Ultraverse. All right, let's let's uh, move on to the next one now. All right, quick quick run through this with the the uh, the pre Ultraverse titles to each of you guys individually. And let's start let's start with Dave this time. What was what's your favorite thing that you guys published before the Ultraverse? Wow. Um, wow. That's I had I hadn't given that much thought. Um, eh, time pro to prob work. probably. I mean, <laughs> I hate to take it away from Tommy, but probably dinosaurs for hire. <laughs> you can't say my own thing. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm wrecked. I'm wrecked. I'm wrecked. I'm wrecking my brain. I can't. Uh, that seems to be my my favorite in terms of you know. Just reading it and having it on the schedule and hoping, you know, having it, secret extra hopes that it does well, that kind of thing before before we started doing that uh, other stuff. Okay. Chris, what about you? Uh, well, you know, I would say, of course, yeah, for Tom, the Dinosaur for Hire was one of my favorites. They were all my children. So oh, stop I it. Felt, uh, I felt I, I love the books. Uh, one book that has a special place in my heart always was Ninja High School. Um, I loved working with Ben Dunn, total, total sweetheart of a guy. Um, I, I thought his creativity was great, and the books just cracked me up. I, I always thought that there was, you know, that there was a, a TV series, animated TV series, or something in that in that series. Yeah, it was yeah. one that I discovered uh, as I was reading Dinosaurs for Hire, uh, and you guys had you know back issue ads in the uh, in, in the black and white books, and uh, so I ordered some of the Ninja High Schools, and I thought they were hysterical. Yeah, and and the other thing about Ninja High School that I loved with with working with Ben is that. He was very consistent. The books were consistent uh, all the way down the the, the 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 line, and they were high quality. And he was fast. He was able to deliver them on time. So there was always this feeling of we've got another Ninja High School coming out, and it's going to be good. Yeah, I, I love that because that wasn't always the yep. case, you know, in and, terms of comic book production. And also, there's there's a thing with with Ninja High School because of the way the industry works. Uh, and the way you have to solicit well in advance, we'd always get the cover like three months ahead of time. Yeah. And Ninja High School was the one where you look at the cover and go, oh, I can't wait for this thing to come in. And so we're, I want the issue that's going to come in and support this cover. Yeah. Uh, the way I thought good. comics should have been done. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I thought that all comics were done that way. <laughs> right. Tom? And, well, <laughs> that's rare. <laughs> for, for me, the 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 books are the books. And so my favorite books are based on experiences I had either putting the book together or with the creators. Like I like, I like the dark wolf books because I like talking to RA Jones on the phone a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Cause he was a good smart guy and he had some interesting ideas. Uh, and then I loved working on the planet of the apes books because my, my favorite part was when I would send all the stuff to uh, 20th century Fox for approval. And they would call up and say, why are you sending this stuff? Stop sending us stuff. <laughs> and so, and so, right, and so, and, and, so and, and then you'd, you'd, then you talk to uh, the licensing people at Paramount, and um, uh, even though we were doing Deep Space Nine and DC had the Next Generation, you find out that the problem that DC had with Next Generation is that, as part of his renewed contract 
um, to do more episodes of the show, uh, 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 Patrick, Patrick Stewart sure. had a, a clause in his contract added that he got to dictate how the shape of his head looked when it was drawn. So it, he, he was concerned that his bald head was too pointy. So for me, <laughs> for me, making comics, it's not so much about the comics themselves. It's the, advent, it's the adventure that comes along mm -hmm. with, with making stuff. Yeah. Sure. I think that, that I think that's a real thing too. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously I've, I've already tipped my hand that my favorites dinosaurs for hire, but I also want to put a plug in there for Scarlet and Gaslight. Mm -hmm. well, that's, yeah. that's, that that's actually, I, I think if, uh, if you talk to Martin Powell, that's one of the most successful books that we ever did. Uh, Cause it was one of the first creator owned books we did. It's, it's almost never been out of print. It's gone through like seven different versions or eight different versions over the years. And it gets a lot of accolades from Sherlock Holmes fans. And uh, we, we reprinted the trade at least once, if not twice. And like Tom said, it's, it keeps getting reprinted and reprinted and reprinted. Yeah. Oh, look at those things. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was great working with Sergio, too. I remember when that cover came in for Walking Dead. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Let's get to the Ultraverse. Okay, then. Oh, oh can I start? You sure. can. Okay. Ask the first question. <laughs> what I happened next? Some, I thought you had something to contribute, Tom. <laughs> well, I, I do, but I want to see if we're going to go there first. Oh, okay. He ironed his shirt. He did contribute. <laughs> I did. I'm ready. I've, I've got it. Well, it is. It is. It is. How did how did you guys have sort of covered how the ultraverse started? But what was the genesis of you know, like we're gonna do our own superhero universe for you guys? Oh, how please, did that start? Please let me tell it. Please let me tell it. Go. Okay. <laughs> what happened is that um uh oh maybe I shouldn't, but I I will anyway. Um we had this uh arrangement with a guy named Bob Jacob at Malibu at uh Acme Interactive, and he had joined uh his company with Malibu Comics. And so we had a, uh, a video game partner and a comic book partner. And so Bob came to the first meeting. We all used to meet every Tuesday uh, around a, a table at our favorite restaurant. And Bob shows up in the first meeting and he said, <laughs> he's, he's really pissed off. He said that um, in order to establish his bona fides, that there was a new sheriff in town and that he was going to teach us how to make comics and that we were the stupidest people he'd ever seen because we had let image slip through our fingers. And, you know, we didn't retain any of the image titles after the image creators left to start, to start their own company. And we tried to explain to him, well, that's not the way that was not the image deal. The image deal was they could come to us. It's creator owned. They could leave it at any time. And he thought that was the dumbest thing in the world. And so he said, why don't we create, you guys better create something else. And so that, <laughs> that was really the genesis of where the idea originally came from. Okay. Just do something. So how quickly did it come together? Quicker than I, we expected. I think <laughs> I think what ha what happened is that within a week Chris had a giant like 10 page brief that he put together about Chris, what, what we could do. Chris, what was your what was your spark of that? What was the what was Well, we we were you know, the interesting thing about Malibu is that, you know, all three of us were always, and, and Scott too, were always, you know, there's half creative discussions and then there'd be half business discussions. So it wasn't just like we were off in a corner thinking just creatively, or we were off in a corner just thinking about how we could create, collect our own comics or something. It was kind of half and half. So what well, the way it started was I came up with some different options about what we could do as a, you know, as a target. Like what, 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 what should, what, how do we differentiate ourselves from what's out there? And at the time, if you remember, it was all about art. It was all about the artists. And so the the idea was, one of the ideas, I think there was like three or four of them that we had come up with. One of the ideas was, what if we made it a writer-centric universe and that we start trying to get in some of these kind of crazy, big, big concepts, big ideas, rather than being just about guys punching each other in the best way possible? What if we could do something like that and get like science fiction authors interested and movie guys interested and some some of the Silver Age guys that we love that did some of the great comics for Marvel and DC and some also some new blood, some new guys that were up and coming. But if we were to mix that up and come up with um, a real story-driven universe with a big backstory that linked everything together. 
um, that, but it made sense. It wasn't like just organically grown over 50 years. It would actually make sense from the ground up. And everybody liked that idea. That's kind of where we started. And then it was like, well, who are we going to get to be part of this? And how are we going to organize it? So on the business side that people were invested in it um, financially, but the company still owned it. And we were able to not have an image situation where everybody left after a year. And so we kind of danced around all those different ideas and put the Ultraverse together from there as both a business concept and a editorial concept. Um, and then we started actually coming up with the characters uh, at, uh, on an offsite, at, at an offsite, rather. Did they leave anything out, Tom or Dave? No, that was pretty much no. it. We wanted, to, we wanted to create a sandbox where a whole bunch of people could come and play yeah. sort of at their convenience and um, they could contribute sort of as much as they could. So that's how we got guys like Simonson and Jake and, you know, into the mix. Yeah. So one of the things one of the things that occurred to me, Chris, about what you just said is your description of new guys and established guys as writers and science fiction and good artists. You guys pretty much hit that in terms of in terms of your mix. I like to think so. Yeah. No. We we're, yeah, we're, we worked real hard at it. Yeah, we had and we we also we got we can't talk about the guys we crossed off the list for various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't, Tom. Please I'm don't. not. I believe me, I'm not. But um, we assembled a we just assembled a giant list of you know here's here's some people that start paring down. And you have to pare down because it was it was an era of exclusive contracts with people and uh, guys who only wanted to work for Marvel and DC or yeah. um, and who's available and. Who only wants to work on certain stuff, and so you just sort of have to, you have to make a giant list because then you have to start, you have to start paring down the pool of who's available, and then out of who's available, who's interested, and out of who's interested, who would be a good fit. Yeah, I mean, because, and good fit was important. We really wanted team players because right. it's going to be a shared universe. So we didn't really want to have prima donnas as being part of. It. We wanted to have people that could link together and and work well as a team. That's where we were creating essentially a writers' room for comics, and so. Yeah. If you're gonna put if you're gonna put six, eight, ten creative people together in a room, you know you can't have you can't have the bad apple. You've got to have guys who understand that we we have a we have a common goal and we can fight about how to get there. But the goal itself is within everybody's grasp. Niall, is one of the next slides the uh, uh, the the Ultraverse conference? Uh, there we go. Oh, there they are. There we are. There they are. So, you had your 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 Malibu guys, right? And then talk talk a little bit about the 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 the, the core writers there because that's a pretty great group. Yeah, it's an uh, astonishing group. I mean, I've been a Gerber fan for my whole life, and the fact that he was available yeah. and willing to come on, and a little bit. It's not fair to say less so. I was an Engelhard fan. Um, Huddle had just come off the autobiography of Lex Luthor or something. Yeah, which, 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 which is a great that, book and sold tons. And, and it should be it should be the definitive take on Lex Luthor, man. It's just such a great book. Yeah, it's it a great book. It hadn't been that long since Barr had come off of Camelot three thousand. Straczynski had done outstanding work on the Impact line over at DC. Yes, mm -hmm. and James Robinson was just up and coming, and Gerard Jones was at that point. The steadfast rock at both Marvel and DC. Yeah. So, and we'd worked with a lot of these people before. So, like, uh, Barr was working on Star Trek Deep Space Nine for us. Um, uh, Gerard Jones had worked for us on The Trouble with Girls. Oh, girls, sure. Um, and Len Straczynski was working with me on a Street Fighter comic book. Um, and so, and one of the things that, uh, look, I'm pointing. Uh, one of the things that. Uh, <laughs> what are you what saying? Are, what? What? I'm, what are you I'm, saying? I'm pointing at the slide like anybody cares. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, one of the things is that uh, each of these guys was um, brought something different. So, Mike Barr really loved a sort of Batman ish locked room mystery story. Engelhart was really good at taking established superheroes and sort of uh, going off in a new direction. Gerber was. Take was good at taking established superheroes and just making them crazy. I think we were all fans of his. Yeah. Def For me, I was more a fan of his defenders than I ever was of Howard the Duck. Sure, the defenders uh, were awesome. Right, and and Huddle and Jones and Robinson were like the new kids. And Struzuski, I'd been a fan of 
a thing he did. Uh, how do you pronounce Mike Perobek's name? Is it Perobek or Perobek? It's Perobek. Perobek. He had done with Perobek uh, the Justice Society of America, which was like a 10 issue superhero team book, which was really, really impressive and sort of stood out from all the other DC books at the time. And so I advocated strongly to, to bring him in. And I think uh, Chris and Dave brought in Engelhard Gerber and Hudnall. Now, where you have uh, on, on this uh, thing, out of the artists, you actually give a call out here to Aaron Lopresti, Dave. Uh, why, why mention him as opposed to some of the other guys? Um, because early on, um, uh, it, it, it ends up being Gerber's fault, basically. And <laughs> no, no, nobody, nobody ended up loving. I mean, I knew Steve Gerber and I loved his work. And then I got a chance to work with him and just, I, I, I'm so blessed to have been Steve Gerber's friend. I can't even tell you now I'm getting all choked up, but Gerber was really struggling. He had undiagnosed sleep apnea for like 40 years. He had not slept through the night in 40 years. Hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons his stories are so freaking loopy. It's because he was sleep deprived basically his entire writing career. Um, but he couldn't meet a deadline to save his life. At some point, we actually had him come to the offices and write all day in our marketing department in order to make his deadlines. And so pretty early on, he started missing deadlines. And Lepresti kept going, I got to draw this issue of sludge. I have to draw this issue of sludge. What do I do? And then Chris would go, well, I'm looking for somebody. And Aaron would go, well, I've got this idea, this idea, and this idea. And, and Chris would go like, okay, draw it. <laughs> what did you want to talk about that, Chris? Yeah, just, you know, I mean, again, I, 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 I think about Steve almost every day. Uh, Steve Gerber. It was a, it was, it was my joy to be able to work with with him, and I loved his stories. But yeah, he was definitely he had, he had you know issues being on time. And Aaron is just was like an eager, you know, tall, gang, gangly puppy all the time. He always had new ideas and new things he could do, <laughs> and you know, images that he wanted to get out there. And so, what would happen is we just would you know I talked to Steve and say, look, I we gotta you know. <laughs> We gotta get moving. So Aaron's got this idea, and then I would try to get them to work together on Aaron's idea that Aaron could then go ahead and pencil while Steve would do the dialogue for us. We kind of try to do it marble style. So we we had a, a couple different approaches. One was they're working together. One is that Steve does a full script and then gives it gives it over to us, and we and Aaron jumps on it. And and a couple where Aaron just ended up doing a like a complete fill in that was his own story. And then yeah. I'd work with uh, I'd work with Aaron on this on the script. So and one of, one of the things you know. to me that was interesting is that even though Aaron was an up and coming guy, uh, he was already really good, and oh, yeah. only and only kept getting better. Yeah, I don't yeah. like to tell him that, but yeah, that's true. And one of, the, was, one, of the, one of the funniest things about Aaron was when we're setting up the Ultraverse, um, he we we had a bunch of books that still didn't have artists and Chris was trying to get them assigned and he offered him hard case and he said wait a second can i draw the sludge monster and i said sure but that's like you know the fifth or sixth in the launch line so we want to launch it in october for halloween he says i don't care i want to draw the sludge i want to i want to draw the swamp monster <laughs> okay dude knock yourself out yeah so so what did you know what did Larry Nevin add to the the, the concepts? Uh, Larry was great. I mean, Larry Larry was not a comic book guy, so he didn't have that comic book vocabulary about you know about um, uh, what would what would work with the fans, what wouldn't. Like he he didn't like the idea of Prime because he didn't like the idea of the the Gorp and the the kid actually climbing out of the disintegrating body. Like he just thought that yeah. was gross. It wasn't going to work, right? Whereas of course, comic book fans were like that's perfect. Yeah, they, they totally loved it. But what I loved about it, I'm a huge, huge Larry Niven fan. Loved his known uh, known space stuff. Loved his Ringworld stuff. And what Laura, uh, what he brought to it, what Larry brought to it was this um, this giant uh, disc world that we had that was like an alternate universe that you could actually go to that he had created that was more of a realistic, like what would happen if we had a world that was literally like a giant LP um, out there? What would that do on, on the edges? Where would things be? And we had this thing whole, completely mapped out. Um, and, uh, and so we built this Bible that was, had a lot of Larry's concepts in it, uh, as well as everybody else's concepts. And 
it was kind of my job and the editor's job to kind of figure out how it all made sense <laughs> and plug these okay. different parts in and uh, and then build this kind of meta world. In fact, it was, you know, the we were visiting the megaverse, right? Uh, we weren't the ultraverse. The ultraverse uh, how did happened that change? later. Oh, we, had, we had a legal letter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, all the early stuff was all megaverse because that was the, we, were, we were just in love with that name, right? Mm -hmm. Because it started with an M and sounded awesome. You know, it was mega, mega powerful, right? But we couldn't we couldn't use it, and we were all disappointed that we had to go to something else. And we came up with Ultraverse, but over time, it's like I really like Ultraverse a lot better. So it's just interesting yeah. now. Okay. Because yeah. also, we started calling the the heroes Ultras, which sounds right. a lot better than calling them Megas. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, and then, and one of the funny things about Larry is that um, in the meetings that he would show up for, um, when we're all sitting around the table, he would sort of challenge us. In, in ways it sort of sounds stupid on the face of it, but then the more you think about it, the more you think, oh wait, I think Larry's got something. Where he yep. would say, he would say something to the group. He would say, look, why don't you guys stop thinking about superheroes as having, you know, invisibility and super speed and super strength, whatever. Why don't you start thinking about the superpower manifesting itself as something completely different? Like suppose there's a guy whose superpower is that he can park his car parallel perfectly every time. And it's like, well, that's a stupid analogy for superhero power, but it gets your brain sort of thinking about, oh yeah, it doesn't always have to be invisibility, super speed, super strength, flight. Yeah, and so it might, might be might be like practical accounting. You know? Right. Yes. That's <laughs> there right. You go. <laughs> I've got free check. Super CPA. That's okay. right. All right, Niall, let's hit the next slide. All right. So uh, there's a couple of slides here, and we we'll go through them pretty quickly, but. Um, tell us about how this the Scottsdale conference happened and who all attended. Well, I uh, Tom, I got charged with finding a place that was within an hour's flight of L.A. or two hours flight of L.A. And so I found I thought Scottsdale would work um, because they had a lot of resorts um, with big hotels and a lot all kinds of amenities, so we never had to leave the building. And um, it was you know there's no jet lag or any other issues to worry about. And it was just simple. We could all get on a plane, fly over there in the morning, spend a couple of days there and then sort of fly back. And, um, the, actually the, the hotel industry in Scottsdale at that time is very accommodating to, uh, people who want to show up in large groups. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a note, there's a note on this and I don't remember this part from the panel. Uh, so, Chris, I want to ask about this. It says after day one, Chris spent the whole night digesting and summarizing the day before. What was involved? Uh, well, the first thing that was involved in that was that I had an early laptop. You know, at that time, people really didn't have laptops everywhere. We certainly in the comp biz, they didn't have laptops everywhere. And I had my brand new, I think it was a $5,000 um, Macintosh laptop. And I think I tripped, where was it? Somewhere in the, in the, in the ballroom or in our, in our main room. And smash the, you know, smash the laptop to pieces. So oh, everything man. I was going to do on the laptop, I couldn't do, and I had all my notes and everything else. So I quickly had to go to kind of yellow pads and, you know, summarize all the stuff that we were doing on, on a on a borrowed Macintosh Plus computer and start putting it all putting it back all together. And um, you know, the the first day. It, it, we didn't know how it was going to work, right? How do you get a bunch of people and put them in a room? Or is it a writer's room at that point? We didn't get, we didn't know each other yet. You know, nobody had like, didn't have the, in a writer's room, you need to have that social ability to basically criticize something or to push somebody, but, uh, but, but have their respect. So it's not going to turn into a fight. Right. So and that really, have that. So, so that really relied on that you guys had picked the right people. Uh, picked the right people. Yeah. And we tried to set the right culture right from the beginning where we were respectful and open to all the different ideas. And my whole thing was just to take as many ideas as we could and not like really uh, torpedo anything. You know, we didn't fire hose anybody in the beginning. And there were some, you know, there weren't some, not everything was a, was a, a total winner. But of that first day, I, I think we, there was about three or four that were super solid. Mm -hmm. And we had different tacks to try to figure out like the next thing we wanted to do with the blue sky stuff. Then we would did, hey, what would our version of this be, you know, uh, of this uh, concept or character? And just kept trying to keep it moving so that we got a lot of different ideas that we could go through. And then, Chris, and then also one of the... Go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Oh, and so one of the advantages of having a guy like Gerber or Engelhart in the group 
especially Gerber, is he would sort of sit in the back of the room and go, Marvel did that, 1967. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it worked then, it's not going to work now. That's right. And so, um, and so you would have, um, you would get a lot of, and a lot of it is the, you know, the first, well, for me anyway, it, the first day doesn't really look like anything because nothing, nothing is sort of set. There were a lot of good ideas, but there were also a lot of bad ideas that you have to sort of we through, and there were a lot of ideas that you look at and go, well, that's a stupid idea. But then three hours later, somebody goes, oh, what if we took that idea that was yeah. stupid at 10 o'clock and now at three o'clock, we put it with the 2.30 idea and all of a sudden, you know, boom, there's something there. And so um, even if an idea seems stupid, we still wanted it to circle around in the air in case we wanted to come back to it and apply it to somewhere else. And so mm -hmm. it's, it is essential to find people in a, in a room you know, because there, I think there were eight or nine of us at that point who understand that, you know, yeah, we're not going to deal with that now, but let's come back to it and sort of see if there's a way to stitch it back together without anybody's feelings getting hurt. Yeah, leading that discussion was extraordinarily difficult. I mean, it really was hurting cats because we had a lot of strong personalities in that room. <laughs> and but Chris did an amazing job. Chris really, really uh, was a superstar um, in terms of trying to keep that room in um in line but the funniest story to me is somebody said something and i, I don't even remember who for sure anymore oh, it's, it's huddle <laughs> and gerber gets up <laughs> and doesn't say a word and just walks over to the wall and starts banging his head against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> <about that>. yeah. <laughs> He didn't say a word to anybody. He wasn't disruptive. He just got up and started whacking his head against the wall. I, Dave, Dave, I think we have a different definition of disruptive. <laughs> uh, was... Well, compared to what else went on in that room, it wasn't disruptive. Okay, all okay. All right. In I mean, all fairness. It's all relative. So, all right. Then we get into, as you guys are cranking up, Um. Chris, I think earlier you mentioned that the conversations were often hybrid business and creative discussions. Right. Was the was the marketing always integral? Yes. 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 There was always a whole business plan. It was never an editorial plan that we'd figure out what to do later. It was always let's put all the stuff together and steal a march on everybody because that's what the advantage we had was we were small and we were focused. And that's what we wanted to to, to bring out. And mm -hmm. and also we had um, because of the image deal and because of our close approximation to Los Angeles and to Hollywood, we had developed a lot of contacts over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. As a as a California based comic book company, pretty much everybody who was anybody in Hollywood wanted to come out just for the experience of I I wonder what that looks like. Let's go take a look. And so you know everybody from. Uh, Kathy Garver, who used to be on Family Affair, to uh, the producers of Sneakers would sort of troll through the office on any given day just to see how comics were made. And so we knew them, we knew agents, we knew producers, we knew people who wrote about comics for the Wall Street Journal and the Los Angeles Times. And so, um, you know, the idea was to make them, if not partners in this venture, then certainly understand that there's this thing happening just down the street. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, Jeff, well, one of the things we found out when we started <laughs> after is that a lot of comic book publishers, editorial and marketing mm -hmm. and production are all separate little fiefdoms, right? And they have A competing A priorities. Adver adversarial. Right. And from day one, Malibu was never like that. Chris no. was always at all the big decisions about marketing. Tom was always there for all the big decisions about editorial. I was there for all the big decisions about everything. So we were always on the same page. And if we ever weren't, we would go somewhere, get on the same page, and then come back. So we weren't presenting competing information to the people we were supervising, to the rest of the company. And yeah. to find out that other companies weren't run like that, I just thought was insane. Yeah, I, yeah, so I we, remember. Yeah. I remember learning that, learning of you know, talking to you guys early on, and getting this idea that that's how it was. And then, then I got in the industry and I found out like, oh, it's not really like that. <laughs> yeah, so we we would have 
we would have, uh, especially when there was a problem, that somebody would call us up and say, look, I have a problem with you guys. And then the three of us would go, okay, well, who knows this guy the best? It was no mm -hmm. longer a, there's no longer a marketing problem or a business problem or a creative problem. It's like, all right, well, Dave has a personal relationship with this person. Dave should take the call, even if it's about editorial or even if it's about mm -hmm. Uh, right. marketing or even and you, about, uh, whatever. You guys, and you guys would live with whatever came out of that absolutely yeah that's how it has that's how it has to be to work right absolutely because I mean, it, we never wanted to be in a, in a situation where a guy would come to us with a problem and then just tell us oh you can't solve it for me i need to talk to dave we always wanted to be sort of proactive and say no the guy you need to talk to is yeah. is dave or chris yeah. or tom and so here's the phone Hey, Tom, That's, do you, do you remember the meeting when Kamiko tried to hire you and me away from Malibu, like really early on? Yes. And so Shrek meets with us and we start talking to Shrek and it becomes clear that Shrek doesn't have any idea what's going on on the business side of Kamiko. <laughs> Not the first clue. Like he's just over here in the corner, like massaging creators and creating pages that they can put in their comics he has nothing i had no idea about any of the rest of it tom and i walked away from that meeting going i don't want to do that yeah. <laughs> how do they how do how, i couldn't how, figure how, out how, how does any how, how does that even make how do they even make that work half half our job was spreadsheets and sales figures always mm -hmm. everybody yeah. all of us we and knew we knew we knew everything and we had we had charts we had graphs we had um but charts and graphs yeah charts yeah, and graphs. Yeah, we had yeah. We had calculations based on price points, based on sales figures. We knew mm -hmm. the cost of printing. We knew shipping times. We knew it was all it was all one giant part of our brain. And, 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 and Scott would come to us after he saw the original solicitation list and go, hey, dudes, we're not going to make our nut that month. And Tom would call up Blackbeard and go, okay, what other newspaper strip can we reprint to get us over the hump this month? Right, that's I, how we, stuff like Charlie Chan came to came. Because we need Charlie Chan comic book reprints came into being. We had we had a magic number every month. This is how much how many dollars we need to come in the door in order to stay open and keep cash flow constant. And so, and we would chart out our schedule six or eight months in advance, and we would look at it um, like religious scholars to try to figure out, you know, well here's this book. We need to put this book on this month. We need to put that book on that month. And it was a constant juggling act to try to hit that magic number every month. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. Hey, uh, I want to talk a bit. Uh, the, it's mentioned here in the, the middle thing about Dave Dorman's uh, po promo poster. Oh, yeah. What? I'm, I'm remembering something about some location where one of these benches or bus stops or something appeared really oh. close to another publisher oh Co yes Co koblish tells a great story about coming out of the marvel offices and there's a bus stop bench right outside the exit of the building <laughs> and there's the giant multiverse yes. poster <laughs> so tom tell them how that happened because there's here's, actually a story attached to how it happened here's the great thing about that is that when you're going to buy bus benches and you're going to buy buses and you're going to buy those bus shelter things with a big display um the company that does it actually has a map of every location for where it is. And so they sent us the map and it turns out it turns out that there's there's a location right outside the DC offices and there's a location right outside the Marvel offices. And we said we don't really care where the others go, but we definitely want one right there and we want one right there. I have and this uh, <laughs> I have this weird memory of Scott getting this impish grin on his face and looking at all this going do you guys want to put a bus bench ad outside the Marvel <laughs> DC offices? <laughs> Hell yes! And we're like, yes, we do. We we, we did love being oh, you so know the bad great. boys. Yeah, we, we, did, we did love being the, the the guys who were you know were small and scrappy and trying to figure it out all the time. Well, I mean, really you guys were doing something. You know, obviously, when when I think Malibu too, it's like I remember the commercials. You know, I don't remember DC Marvel commercials or anything like that, but I remember Malibu commercials. And uh, I mean, what was the brainchild of, of kind of going in and doing something the other publishers weren't? That right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, and, and it started early on. I mean, there are there is footage somewhere. Actually, I don't know if it still exists, but during the the big show that we did, and we can mm -hmm. come back to the Ultra Conference in a second. But during that show, our quote unquote film department was taking all the creators off to the side and shooting little mini interviews for them. So 
in the, in the era of all everybody going to video, we were out ahead of it. We just couldn't survive long enough to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. everybody, everybody got interviewed. Darren sat there. Our, our, our film team sat there, yeah. interviewed him, interviewed him from two angles. One was black and white. One was color. They, they edited it all together. And it was, it was really cool. And it was really a great promotion for continuing to get that word out. We showed that footage at San Diego one year yes. where you, you'd, you'd fight. They had a trade show. We invited the retailers into a little, we created a little booth so no one could see inside. And you had to go through this little, um, curtain you know <laughs> sit in a little theater i mean we showed them the footage what what was the reaction to the ads uh wow well it's hard to tell because there was so much all, yeah. all there was so much stuff going on all at once and i mean positive no right you can't, yeah, it, was, it was wonderful but yeah. it was just a bit it was just the mix of everything else too right. and where and, and where the ads sort of failed is that there's no way to track how successful they were like you can't you you can't just there's no internet. There's no. The, the only call. The no only reference. call to action is go buy comics, and you can't tell if they were going to go buy comics anyway. That's, yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. So, yeah. So there, there's not any. There's not any participation that's trackable from that, as which is the case with most advertising. And also, still. And also, one of the things that we were very clear about is we didn't want to have. We didn't have the infrastructure set up to actually sell the comics through the ads. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, call now <laughs> and, and get you know the first three things or whatever. And we also didn't want to do that because it felt like our target audience was actually the retail stores. Yeah. And so we didn't want to do this thing where it's TV commercials, where we're, we're competing with our, with the people that we consider to be our the target audience. Well, the no. bread and butter. Absolutely. absolutely. Right. You're looking, you're looking to be taken seriously as a player uh, by the retailers who do the ordering, you know, yes. you know and the ads set you apart from Marvel and DC and any, but any other, uh, third parties uh, by the fact that you guys actually have ads. Yeah. Well, yeah. But we, we, I had a discussion with somebody about putting in a call to action to actually sell the comics mail order and make that part of the TV ads. And I think it came to me just before the Ultra Conference. And then as soon as the Ultra Conference was over, we went another way. We decided that was yeah. not the direction we wanted to go. And that mm -hmm. the, the, the noise created by the commercials and the sort of the shock and awe that they actually existed and that somebody was advertising on television was actually the win. Sure. Yeah. And I, I put a shout out a little bit to Scott too, because you know, in, in companies you've got executives that are snipers or medics, right. And uh, that shoot down every new idea. Uh, th those are the snipers and the guys that actually welcome new ideas and will, you know, defer to trying them are the medics. And Scott was definitely a medic. He would always, if there was, if there was a new crazy idea to try on, on the marketing side or one that, that um, that was something that, something that nobody had ever done before. He would want to do it. Yeah, and the great cool. the great thing about Scott is the the middle part of that, the execution part, he's terrible at. And so, but what he's good at is he's good at supporting the crazy idea, and he's yeah. good at seeing it through to the end. And as it's being developed, he's really good at sort of coming in and saying, "Oh no, that's going to piss off the retailers. Oh no, the fans won't like that. Oh no, that." So he 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 can't physically do the work. But he really comes in well as the medic and sort of goes, well, we should try, you know, try this or try that. Knowing, knowing how it was going to play and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the thing about Scott is of uh, he's a he's a he's a businessman who works. He carries around numbers in his head like crazy, but he's also a fanboy. Um, you know, he got he got he loved the stuff. Oh, he totally loved. Oh, the stuff. my God. Yeah. And there was there was yeah, ask him someday about his love for Supergirl. You won't get away for a half hour. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he he was he was a he was an obsessive compulsive fanboy who got into comics distribution just so he could touch all the comics, and then you know he grew from there. Oh, hey, here's, Tom, the, here's Tom, Tommy. Talk for a second about the importance of that ultra conference. I think it gets brushed over sometimes. Yeah. Which one? But the ultra conference when we had the Westlake. Oh, that was at the Westlake Inn. That was great. So that was. That was an idea. I, I forget which of the four of us or any of the four of us had the idea, but the execution of it with Dave. There we go. I think maybe I, it was Dave. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Now that I think about it, it might be. And so, uh, <laughs> so, so, so Dave, that's D A V E, he, he had this idea of let's just bring everybody together, uh, everybody who's going to be sort of a part of this. Let's bring the press. 
the big retailers, the distributors, some of the artists and writers. Let's bring as many of them as we can together to one location and let's do like we're unveiling a new car. And um, there was this, the hotel, the Westlake uh, Hotel in Westlake Village had this giant conference area that could accommodate everybody. And we just started um, making the arrangements and it was all put together. Uh, you got to give a shout out to Alan Payne and Ty Ruley because they actually, you know, <laughs> Dave had to come up with the idea. But I, yeah, I didn't do the we, work. We didn't have to do the work. No, so no, no, no. no. You don't so want to be planning an event. No. So, that's... so Alan, Alan and Ty got all the invitations out, got all the, uh, all the hotel reservations set up. They did all the, the, uh, the swag that went out. And so, and so we put on this conference and you can see from the, the photo, there's Chris and there's all the, the founding writers and, you know, they got to talk about their work. They, they met, uh, they met the press. We had cocktail party. We had a big dinner for everybody. We took everybody in groups to tour the office to show how the ultraverse was being made. Everybody got to, to touch original artwork and got to see how the coloring process was going to work. And for the the day and a half or two days, it's like the 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 one of the best things we ever could have done. And at the end of it, we all went to Universal Studios on on two charter buses. Yes, that's right. A, a so, total California experience. So how many how many retailers did you have out of this in that thing? Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> there I, I there was, was probably there two. was probably ten or twelve influential retailers, but uh -huh. all the distributors were there and they're looking out for the you know, they're sure. obviously their bread is buttered where the retailers are. Sure. Right. So right. we sort of felt like we didn't need a ton of retail. Um, we just needed the the big influencers. You needed a couple people that'd talk, right? Yeah, and yeah. keep us yeah keep us away from the landmines for sure. Right, That's and also great. also the other thing too is that because the books weren't out yet, if you you basically open up your hearts to the retail community and to the dis distribution community, and you hope that well you hope they love it, but you also hope that they can poke at it a little bit, and say okay well here's what you should do. And so one of the guys um, who was there was a guy from Capital City named Wayne Markley. Yeah, sure. And, and um, he took me aside for like 45 minutes. And, and not in a critical way, but in a very sort of <laughs> – in a loving, supportively warm embrace. He said, yeah. well, <laughs> if, if I were you guys, I would do X, Y, and Z, and here's how Capital City can help you. And so right. the right. sort of the conference pays off in moments like that where you think, okay – Here's the guy who's going to be responsible for basically 30% of our market. And he's not only bought in, he's got some ideas to help, and he's got some landmines we can stay away from. We, we, we were also trying to get new people involved. Like if you'll notice here on the on the side of the bus there, the the slogan is jump on now. Who's that aimed at? Right? It's that aimed at people that don't that aren't reading the comics now. Right. We're right, trying to get right. new people to actually go to comic book stores. So um, which which you know, the big companies really hadn't done very much outreach. To try that was and a get little bit. People. That was a little bit of the commercial too, where you yeah. you, you, know, you weren't there with the uh, the the beginnings of Spider Man or whatever. Right. Um, hey, talk about this the the Dorman poster there. How big is that thing? The original, oh the the actual poster poster. Yeah, that's that was twenty four. That was twenty four by thirty six. Oh, so it's just, oh, that's the, just well, that poster there is twenty four by thirty six. The buzz bench was much bigger. The buzz that's like bench three was, feet by six feet. Was was yeah, six yeah. feet to a six feet tall, two and a half yeah. by six feet or something. Okay. Yeah. All right. Three three and a half by six feet. It was it was it was it was six feet tall for sure. The one that went in the bus benches. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's oh it was... look at that caterpillar. Oh my god. You know the funny thing is that looks like it's fake, but it's not. <laughs> it's real. I know. <laughs> That's Stuart. Wait, really wait a second. Here. Wait a second. Seriously, I I never knew that. That was that was real. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we had to look great. at that every. We had to look at that it's, every day. It's it's a very sad period of my life, but I'm glad I get to share with everybody forever. It's his Fidel uh, Castro cosplay. <laughs> that's phenomenal. That's <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all real. It's all me, baby. Yep. So that's great. All right, let's let's hit the next slide. I lost track of where we are here. We're now under. Ah, oh, these yes. guys. all right. The ash cans were were they actually ash cans that came out ahead of the series, or were they just promotional items once the things were in the pipeline? Uh, no, they actually, all came out in advance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because here's I mean, the thing: I don't know if they're actual ash cans because the definition is so you know bizarre. But they all came out ahead of the series. We call yeah. them ash cans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It says ash can right a, on there. It was a very it was a very popular term at that time. Yeah. 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 
and also it was a it was a great way to do a, a uh, like the two on the right the the pink one and the lime green one are not on actual comic book paper those are done on uh, at the local print shop paper. <laughs> right yeah construction and, paper yeah yeah and so um it was a great way to sort of sneak out the books long before the books came out and mm -hmm. and so and when we did it well the, the thing about us is that we could never do anything just once so there's never one ash can <laughs> I, think, I don't even i've lost track of how many there were but i think there were like 30 or 40 of them over over a year or so because and, and you can't tell from that but they were not normal size right they were eight and a half by five and a half mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah they're tiny yeah. yeah they're they're small yeah and they're, makes... they're they're fun to make they're and they're you know it's also just like just like dummy books. It's a great way to test out once you've got something lettered and you look at it, you see you see problems that you don't see when they're just pages. Right. That's true. So I've got a, I've got a question. At what point did your fan advisory network come in? Oh, pretty, it's uh, pretty I'll, early, right? It's it's actually part of the original pitch from Chris in his manifesto about what we should do to create a superhero universe. <laughs> is is creating Chris there's a Ta the, ta the the Krasinski, <laughs> there's a the Unabomber of the Ultraverse. There's a <laughs> there's a there's almost a half a page about a fan advisory network about creating the feel of the old Marvel and DC's letters pages, but through the fan base and having the fans be advocates and having the fans go out and bring people in as uh, just build a network of people and so. Uh, but then you quickly realize that, well, somebody actually has to do that. And uh, so then it just became uh, a great idea that had to find a guy. And then we then Chris found a guy uh, who I think started as an intern, Steve Lowry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he became he became sort of the head, the the in-office head of the fan advisory network. And people still talk about him to this day. Oh, I got this from Steve or Steve sent me this or Steve, you know, right. I got a yeah. letter from Steve. And um, and he was great at it because he would just. He would just wander around the office and he would go, I got a, you know, I got a letter from Timmy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He wants something. And, you know, well, take, we had, we had buttons, we had ash cans, we had all this other stuff. It's like, just, you know, send him whatever he asked for, make him part, you know, make him feel special. And that was, that was Steve's job because I, I remember as a kid reading comics that if I ever got anything from a comic oh, book yeah. publisher, it was like, it was like gold. And if we could ever duplicate and we had, we had a, a, a giant swag bag full of stuff that shouldn't just sit on somebody's desk. If we could go, if we could send that out to some fan and make that kid's day, that's, you know. I have a weird untold story of the Ultraverse. I don't think I've ever told this story. Do I need alcohol? No. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom always showed me the best pens to have. And so oh, I yeah. got these pens, but I got them in green. And I had a small supply of them on my desk. So whenever Steve Lowry came in and wanted like a letter signed or something, I never signed it in black because I didn't want it to look like a photocopy. And I wanted it to be a little bit unique. So I always signed it in green. So that when the fan got that letter, they knew I personally signed a letter to them. That's, That's cool, pretty, Dave. I didn't That's even know that. That's pretty cool. That actually changes my entire understanding of the Ultraverse. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's Dave's superpower. It's a, you know, it's a dumb little thing, but I think no, those I, kind of details can make a difference. I, 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 to, I, totally, I totally know that. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my former boss was a uh, uh, formerly a government uh, employee, and he tended to sign everything in black, and I, I made him use blue. I said, because right, they'll know sure. it's still, yeah, and, and absolutely, it's just you're, you're going to know it's real. So I totally get that. I, I think the thing that about the the fan advisory thing is it did whether it produced in numbers the results you guys wanted. I have, I have no idea, but I know it worked because you know I'm I'm experiment number one, <laughs> and and here I am driving a panel <laughs> twenty seven years later because I was such a fan because of what you guys did. Oh, and we uh, also go ahead. I, I just want I, you know. The, the thing about it that's so neat was it felt like what you guys said you wanted from from Chris's manifesto, which is that Marvel that Marvel letter page experience. That it felt like being part of something. And that was, I think those of us that like superhero comics in particular are more susceptible or desirous of that feeling 
than we are of uh, a lot of other uh, yeah. cliches associated with but us. There's sure. there's a there's a thing that went around on social media. I think it was last week that came out from Ross Ritchie, which is that comics are about community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and what publishers really sell and sometimes forget is that there's a sense of community that the the comic book store itself is like a clubhouse and uh, you know for both good and bad points i guess but yeah it's a it's a clubhouse where where people meet and they gather together and they talk about comics and they they play magic the gathering and they do all this other stuff and that's i don't think we understood that 25 years ago but that's mm-hmm. what we were trying to do is trying to build a little community of people. The, the, the clubhouse, yeah. the clubhouse feeling is something matter of fact, in his interviews this last week is something Steve Jeppy mentions and has mentioned yeah. as long as I've known him. And I think that the thing that's so accurate about that is, you know, some of it, uh, Tom, I know you do. I work at a distance even before COVID. Um, and my Wednesday new comic day, uh, I meet, a bunch of guys who I met at my comic shop and we go to lunch and get new comics. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my finger hold on sanity some weeks. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that it's still, it's still absolutely true. And here I, you know, I'm in my fifties and it's, it's like, that's the thing that I'm hanging on to. And I'm like, they're guys I met at the comic shop. It's totally the clubhouse thing. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that we did um, that we always tried to do is, when we were at a convention or a trade show or whatever, we were almost always accessible. Like you could, you could oh, drop we by the, that way. You could drop by the booth and there's the editor of the Ultraverse. And oh wait, there's you know Mike Barr and there's. And it's not just like a specific signing time. It's like we're just hanging out. You can come over and if you want, you want five minutes to talk about why Rune has blue hair, then there's a guy who'll give you an answer. And right. um, and so we, and also I think at the time we sort of thrived on that with who doesn't want is uh, uh you know a kid to come up to you at a convention and say look why does why why does your dinosaur carry a walter ppk instead of a uh, 45 <laughs> yeah you know, and that 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 yeah, sounds a dinosaur like, would never carry that <laughs> and that's, that's crazy. And, you, and you think at a certain level well that's that's that seems kind of stupid and irrelevant and then you realize, well, no, that's that's not it at all. That's the whole thing. That's that's really what this is about. There's a guy who read your comic and is upset to some extent, or at least curious, as to why your character is carrying a certain gun. And he's got to come to you and find that knowledge out of your head. It's like that that's I can't do that with mystery books that I like, and I can't do that with TV shows that I like. But with a comic, you can totally walk up to that guy and say, Hey, why does he have a Walter PPK? And this is my, this is, this is one of my, one of my things about comics that why, man, I love movies. I love novels. Uh, There's so many different things in media that are just enjoyable and have brought pleasure to millions over the years, but why I love comics. And this goes for creators as well. If you're sitting at a convention and you just put out your first crowdfunded comic, and you did your best with it, and it looks decent. And I'm not talking like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's just a decent comic book. And they sit you next to uh, Joe Jesco or Jim Shooter or Howard Chaikin. The chances are they're not going to look down their nose at you. No. Uh, they're going to they're going to talk to you like you're a creator, right? And right. and as long as you're not behaving like a, a dimwit or something, right? Um, and but. If you come out with a movie, an indie movie that does relatively well, you're not hanging out with Spielberg. <laughs> right. You know, we are so egalitarian. And so what you said, Chris, about the, about the, uh, and Tom, about the fans and you guys come being at the booth and coming up and you can ask the editor and you can, uh, here's this writer. And again, that clubhouse feeling, I think it's absolutely essential to what those of us that fell in love with the Ultraverse back then uh, was, I think it was part of the experience. Thank you. Thank you. We, we always had a lot of humility. You know, I mean, I think starting off uh, in, the, in the black and white bus probably helped that. <laughs> oh, sure. But uh, but just just having the humility of knowing that, you know, these people are supporting you. They're supporting your company. They're making everything that you do every day possible. Billy, and uh, Billy, I always Billy, felt it, that way, no matter how it, successful we became. Yeah, what, Chris, that's, the ups and downs. That, I, think that, I think that's it. Billy, 
uh, always tells the uh, Billy always tells this story about people coming up and he signs a book for him and they say he said and they say thank you and he says are you kidding no thank you that's right yeah and, and that's it we're 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 getting down to the last fifteen minutes so I want to start right. clicking through some of these uh, some of the the releases here because they're all they're all pretty key uh, Dave you want to walk through or Tom do you well I just want to quick tell the story for the purposes of posterity I've told it a bunch of times and I want to tell it really really quick. Um, when we were looking for an artist for Prime, we got so, so lucky to get Norm Breyfogle. Yes. He was amazing, and he defined Prime for all the readers for a very long time. Absolutely. But he was not the first choice. We wanted Alan Davis. The company bought me a plane ticket to fly to England to seduce Alan Davis into drawing Prime. <laughs> That's not something I want to think about. I know, what, please. Well, what I'm did you wear? Okay, I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm out. Yeah. Well so done. I approach Alan Davis at a convention. Alan Davis says, this is all really lovely, but I'm going to retire from comics and I'm only going to work for my son's Boy Scout troop. Hmm. And I th think it, he was out of comics for all of four months or something. So he <laughs> just didn't want to get involved in a startup and I totally get it, but it was yeah. a pretty, it was a pretty funny excuse. I'm retiring from comics. I'm going to go work for my son's Boy Scout troop. Before we jump into the books as they start rolling out, all right. Do I remember something that you guys had to move move up by several oh, months? That's what I was going to ask Chris, I, and that slipped my mind. Chris, tell him about the fact that when we found out Dark Horse is doing Comics Greatest World. Yeah, well, all of our timetables had to suddenly change. Right, we had this. Uh, very strategic view of how we we're going to roll things out. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, the opportunity is, what was it, Tom, three months early? Is that what we had to do? Yeah, what months? happened is we were, we had the original Ultraverse conference, I think in September, and then we were going to roll out a year later, the following September. Right. And also because September was sort of had a reputation in the industry as black September, when it was the, the crappy time to do anything. Right. Um, we thought we could sort of sneak in into that slot. We figured, okay, well that slot is bad, but it's also open. And with our big marketing push and all the other stuff, we could probably own that space. And then we found out Dark Horse was doing Comics Greatest Worlds, and their timetable was for June of 93. And then once we found that out, it's like, oh, <laughs> we can totally beat them. And so um, it just became a competition to move everything up to be ready three months early. Yeah. All right. Let's 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 roll out with, with – uh, we, we've got Prime and you've got Hard Case. Uh, Chris, what was, what was Hudnall like to work with? It was great. Uh, I mean, uh, frankly, all the guys were, were were great to work with. They were all unique. They all have their own sort of approach to, to doing things. And uh, James was always very. He, he had when he had ideas in his head, he would he would uh, unreal them like a tape recorder. Like you couldn't stop him until he had all the ideas out for the particular things that he wanted to do. And he'd start off sometimes in the middle. And then wind down the, to the end, and then start loop back to the beginning that he wanted to tell you in the first place. So what I found early with dealing with uh, James or working with James was to just let him go, right? L listen to the whole thing, and then ask the questions after he finished, as, rather than interrupting him in the middle of stuff. And uh, he, he was great to work with. He was also he was also deeply deeply serious, and so yes. as as you can yeah, tell, he would never he would never laugh at any of the jokes. Like you know, I no. try to do these little intermittent things, right. never laugh. This this kind of thing, this kind of thing we're, that we're doing now, where we're all laughing and carrying on and having a good time, he would not like that at all. No, he, he, would, be, he would be very uncomfortable if you joked about your even even if I joked about myself, it would make him uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't know if it was uncomfortable. He just wanted to keep going. He was right. on. Maybe he, that was. It. He just. He, it, I was just an interruption to his. Yeah, his, he was at the controls of a rocket ship, and you're like talking about stuff that doesn't matter, right? Right. He's driving that rocket right. ship. Yeah, that's, that's probably right. All right. All right. Strangers, boy, that was a great book. Mm -hmm. Engelhart yeah. had this idea right out of the gate. He, he, yep. he one of the earliest yep. ideas, if I remember yep. correctly. He, he pitched it at almost within the first hour of the original Ultraverse conference. And we were and, so lucky to get Holberg on that book. Boy, oh boy, oh, yeah, it was a great. It was a, all yeah. the different. It was a great support. cover. Just awesome yeah. to work with. Great book all the all the way around. I love some of the character names. And I'll take credit for Adam Bob. That's my favorite man. Absolutely. <laughs> That was that's great, yeah. What was the story with this, Chris? So yeah, this is one of those uh, things we wanted to create that sense of a world, a bigger world that existed outside 
of the comics themselves. And uh, so we wanted to do a kind of a people magazine, which we were calling Ultra Monthly, with the, the idea being that uh, these ultras were kind of celebrities and they're being followed. And, uh, and that was happening in real time, but they didn't know the truth of what was actually going on in the books. So in the Ultra magazine, they'd be saying what they thought was actually happening and, and also bring in Easter eggs and you know narrative concepts that didn't really exist. And also hint at things that were going to be coming up. A lot of what the MCU does now, we wanted to do that in the way that we could, which was more like this kind of slow boat magazine. And we got Paul O'Connor, who had been a longtime contributor and writer to um, Malibu, to basically kind of own this, and he's a game, you know, great friend, the game designer, and uh, and a real, you know, sort of, uh, he loved novel concepts. He's done a lot of different kinds of novel, different, different, interesting concepts. So that's what that's what we did with Ultra Monthly. When Chris, when okay. Chris pitched it. The idea was, what if we published a magazine that looks like it escaped from the Ultraverse? Yep, that's such right. a great concept. Right. Right. If you went and, in, yeah. in the Ultraverse and you were at the newsstand. You could find this magazine. Right. That, yep. that was the high concept, and it was it was a great idea. But it was, it was also another way of, of how can we look at something that Marvel did or DC mm -hmm. did, and do something that was different. And we all I think somebody had brought up the idea of a, the Daily Bugle with J. Jonah Jameson, and that yep. that sort of then evolved to well, Marvel had that, but that really wasn't about superheroes other than Spider Man, Threat, or Menace. So then that it, that morphed into the Ultra Monthly idea. Mm -hmm. And so what well, in Malibu Sun was more of like a "Hey, what's coming up?" kind of thing, right? Oh, yeah. that was the solicitation package. Yeah, it was aimed yeah. At, at retailers and distributors. Yeah, but fans right. loved it too. So yeah, so then we get to Freaks, which had like Simonson concept art, right? Oh, yes. So, oh yeah. So so good. Such yeah. I remember when that came in. So it was just like you can't see the X on the cover of number one. We are so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's, here's here's the funniest well, thing. That, the, the two funniest things for me about Freaks were that when the Simonson thing, when the Simonson cover came in, the first thing out of my head was, really? Why Why can't we have him for the regular book all the time? <laughs> and, and the other thing is, based on the title of the book and the way the market was at the time, we had a large number of fans and retailers who thought the name of the book was Free X. Oh, yeah, they'd ask for Free X all the time. Where right. can I get my Free X? I, I just... I... <laughs> <laughs> How we block that X? I, it's got to be Dave's fault. It's the only thing I can come come up. With. It's Walter's fault. How we how we gonna how how can we cover up pressure so blast? Come, yeah, you, cover up pressure blast. Then it it's ruins Walter's the perspective, fault. right? Well, yeah. yeah, I blame Walter, but still, and nobody drew and nobody <laughs> drew sweet face. Nobody drew sweet face better than Walter. It was just it's great. Just true. I, I love this. I yeah. love I love this stuff. All so right, good. next slide there, Mantra. I don't understand this either. We had Terry Dodson on staff drawing the book, and we had somebody else do the cover. What were we thinking? I, I think it just had to do with timing. Yeah, probably. probably. That seems like that seems like efficiency. A, that seems like a time decision. Uh, actually, no. I, I, I we remember he, Terry. We may we might not have Terry on the book when we solicited it. No, was, we didn't. Or he, was, or he was doing the pages or something. The cover artist was the original. Was going to be the original uh, interior artist. Right. Right. And then and we Terry had the artwork and we solicited it and we had to use it. Yeah, I think you're yeah. probably right. That seems right. Next. Oh, the hologram covers, man. Yeah. Were you guys were you guys talking to the printer all the time and figuring out what you could do, or did you already know you could do these? Uh, well, I don't know. I speak too much. Maybe Dave should speak. S well, Spidey had already <laughs> done that little like trading card size hologram. Yep. And so, but we we were always I was always talking to our chief. But that I actually had a production guy that talked to the printer, and I was we were always badgering him about okay, what cool thing can we do? How much is it going to cost? You know, if it costs a lot, then how do we leverage it so that we don't lose our shirts? Um, and yeah, so so I guess the answer is yes. We were always looking for to do something new. We were always. Yeah. We was always trying to get some excitement whipped up around our stuff. And we always, just so we could sell more copies so that we could send our creators more money. And also the the thing is we because the four of us were sort of had our hand in everything, the conversation with the printer was always ongoing and it was never just one sided. Sometimes the printer right. would, would come to us and say, Listen, I've got a machine that can shoot a hole through a comic book. Are you interested in that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. yes, we so, are. I've I've got a machine that can do foil stamping. Are you interested? Yes. And so a lot of it would be because we don't really know what's inside a, a printer's office because we've never been to one. 
And so a lot of it was just the printer recognizing a way to, oh, I can sell these guys on shooting a hole through a comic book. And I have a machine that'll put sequential numbers on as uh, as it prints. Right. Really? So, that sounds cool. Let's right. do that. And then and then instead of coming up with a plan, we would just go with, all right, what's the next thing we're going to print that we can put sequential numbers on? And That's so right. um, we never let anything go to waste like that. Yeah, yeah. When it came to marketing, we used all parts of the buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard it put better. Yay, prototype. Oh, there it is. I liked I liked prototype a lot. Me too. Yeah. That also came Me from too. the original uh, the original Aldo's yes, conference. Yes, it did. Tom, were you always going to be one of the writers on it, or? Well, it was. Well, here's the funny part about it. It's I shouldn't take any credit at all for it, but I came up with the original idea. Um, which was a superhero that was basically a mascot for a corporation, sort of like the Pillsbury Doughboy if he had superpowers. And wait, 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 wait. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's he only what to me. It, it's only what Pillsbury tells you. Uh, and so, and um, Len sort of sparked to the idea, and then it became a revolving a conversation with Len about sort of building it out, and then that evolved from the original name, which was Company Man to prototype and easily like 70% of the backstory is lens. I'm I'm all the jokes in the first issue were mine. <laughs> all right. Can Exiles. we talk for half a second about the fact that Paul Mounts colored almost all those comics? Yeah. I love One Paul Mounts. Things, I love I love Paul personally, but the mm -hmm. fact that yeah. he had the colors on all those books, boy oh boy. We couldn't have asked for a better guy. No, yeah. and of course, and of course, his lasting impact on on the business is incredible. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Exiles is one of my favorite backstories. <laughs> <laughs> that that book cost a lot of Mexican food. <laughs> yes, it did. The way that one, is the way that one works. Tom and Chris and I were already taking meetings pre Ultraverse, and we'd go out. I don't know once a week and have Mexican food and try to come up with an idea of our comic we could all do together. Where did you go? To, where Where did you go for Mexican food then? Oh, well, yeah, it was all it was all local here to Thousand Oaks ish. Okay, it wasn't the, it wasn't El Coyote. Calm down. No, it was well, Alamo. You know, well, oh, I, yeah. I had to oh, ask. Oh, well, there's also uh, Casa Vega, which I've taken let's, you to. Let's go. Let's go back to Exiles for a second, though. Now, okay. On okay. the slide, yeah, because uh, this is this is a weird thing so finish talking about it dave <laughs> oh i mean it's just it's just amazing i mean we we, I, we created the superhero team and we started we started we wrote the first issue and we thought we were going but it was hard to get it going and paul pelletier did an amazing job on it Beautiful. And it was sort of a work in progress we got to the ultraverse and we're like we have this orphan book what the heck are we going to do with it we could shove it aside we could try to shove it up next to protectors that didn't seem to make any sense considering how good a job pelletier had done on the book let's put it into the ultraverse and it wasn't long after that gerber was like you know what's going to make fans take this book this universe seriously if we kill a shitload of them so he, he did that was that was an idea that gerber brought to the 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 first founders meeting in scottsdale he said well, what if we really what could we do different from the other universes and gerber just said why don't we kill somebody and have them stay dead it's a great idea. It is, and then, and then that evolved because we we're always marketing driven as well as story driven. That became of well, what if we just kill everybody and cancel the book, and it's a big shock and a surprise, and we just don't tell anybody that's what's going to happen. What if when the book comes out and they read the last issue, only then do they understand that's the last issue. the The solicitations for future issues were all fake, and the the characters are actually all dead. Somebody's that, done. Somebody did that recently with continuing solicitations for something. And did it on yeah. Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Walking yes. Dead. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. we did it. We did it first. Clearly. Yeah. You, yeah. You did. And I we remember. Did, we did Walking I Dead first. I remember. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We did Walking Dead first. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I remember. I remember reading issue four and going, "Wait, what?" Yeah. <laughs> people, you have you have no idea how angry people were. Oh God. Well, but that's, what, but that's that's when we that's how we knew that we had connected because. Mm -hmm. Distributors were mad because we fake solicited. Retailers are mad because they had, they had fake ordered, and the fans were mad because hey, wait, they're all dead. But that's <laughs> that was it. That was that was the goal. And, that's, and I think one of the great things about that was you know because 
I, like I said, I was indoctrinated by thinking that your marketing should be working with your creative should be working with, you know, everything together. And I knew that you guys had to collaborate to pull that off. And, and yeah. I knew that people would be mad, but I thought it was freaking brilliant. You know, once I got over the, 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 the initial, like, wait, what? There are, there are six characters on the cover of Exiles number one. I created five of them and I let Steve Gerber kill all of them forever. And the hardest, the hardest part about the whole it hurts a little bit. <laughs> the, the hardest part, the hardest part about the whole series is that we still had to write solicitation copy for issues five, six, and seven, and commission covers, and commission covers, and because <laughs> they weren't coming out. <laughs> oh man, I'm so happy and so proud. Yep, me too. That's, that, it was that was so great. All right, so I, was the gold holograms just a variation of doing the silver ones, or was yes. there something? Okay. The printer, the printer calls up and says, "Hey, you know what? I can also do gold." <laughs> Are, <laughs> Are you guys interested? <laughs> 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 Why? Yes, we are. And also, we were happy with silver, but then gold just sounds like extra special because it's gold. Yeah. So, so make less of them and yeah. hand them out as special gifts and stuff. Right. Fire. Uh, Man, I, we were talking about this before the show started, and I think Firearm is so great because you get to see James Robinson becoming James Robinson. Yep. Yes. All the Chaken covers didn't hurt. Oh, no kidding. Mm. He really understood the appeal of the character in a way that I'm I'm grateful for. Yeah. And one one of the other things we mentioned that is, if this book had had a consistent art, a consistent level of art. You know, Cully is in the process of becoming the Cully we have today, but he's not there yet. Um, and I don't think he, I, I don't think he hit that many issues in a row. Um, if this book had had consistent art, I think there's no way it's not back in print. It's just, it's that good. And it's, to, and I, we, I mean, it was one of those rare books that you got, and the first thing you did was turn to the letter, the text page. To see what Robinson was talking about. Yeah, it was it was it was a phenomenal piece of work. Um, not unlike Leave It to Chance, which you know Robinson also did, which is surprisingly yeah. hard to find, but it's a classic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What about um, how did this lead to the uh, the Firearm Zero the video? It sort of all germinated at the same time, right, Chris? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, think it was one of those things. From the very beginning, it didn't really. Yeah. It was one other aspect that we wanted to do. I mean, literally all parts of the Buffalo, right? It was like, we should make a movie. <laughs> <And I'll... laughs> we're, we're doing everything else. So let's let's make sure that we have a we have some live action. And we had our own internal Malibu films. So well, we, we had, had the, the hard ability case trailer, to do it. right? Yeah. And, and we just hard... followed the hard case trailer. Yeah. And I think, I think somebody, and maybe Dave will raise his hand again. <laughs> but I, I, I think somebody had the idea of since we have an in-house film department and we have comics, why don't we start something in a video and end it in the comic or start something in a comic and end it in the video? Yeah. And um, then uh, then you just sort of once you come up with that idea, then you sort of have to find well, what project could that be? What's the what's the easiest thing to do given the special effects of 1993? What's the thing that you can apply that to? You can't do Prime, you can't do Strangers, you can't do Prototype, you can't do Mantra. That's right. Where, what can you do? And and Firearm is basically, if you strip it down, it's a cop show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you don't need, you don't need fancy sci-fi sets, you don't need fancy special effects, you don't need fancy costumes. And so that that becomes the consideration at that point. That's great. Well, I, my, I memory, just, my memory of it was it was your idea, Tom, but I could be wrong. Well, I'm happy to take credit for anybody else's idea, but <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember being involved. No, I think you said the sentence originally. Let's do a, if we're going to do a film, let's have the film oh. continue into the comic or have the film be the end of the comic. But it made more sense right. for it to be a prequel like, as opposed I, to a <laughs> ending. Right. I, I give more credit to people who actually make that idea happen than somebody who actually says the idea. Fair yeah. enough. But by all, all right. accounts, we probably shouldn't have done it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. a lot of our ideas were like that. But again, it's, Scott was a medic, right? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. So it, we, we talked about Sludge earlier when we were talking about Aaron. 
um, it was a really it was a really great book. And I know talking to some other fans, they were frustrated by Sludge's confused speech, but I thought it was essential to the character. What did you What did you guys think? That's what Gerber uh, argued for. I, I think I was on the other side of that, actually arguing for uh, uh, for more coherent speech coming out uh, so that we didn't lose uh, readers. So I was always very sensitive to that. But Steve felt very strongly that it needed to, that this is the best way to do it. And, uh, and I think ultimately he was right. But I remember it being a discussion. Yeah. And also, and, and, I, and it's way it's a way weirder book than you think it is just by looking at the covers too. By the yeah. way, if you actually read that book, it's a it it's a mess in the best way. It is so mm -hmm. odd and so unsettling. It's well, it's it's terrific. And and also, a lot of it is the uh, sort of the opposing viewpoints of Gerber and Aaron. Is that I think Gerber, like with the same with Man Thing, he never saw Sludge as the main character. Right. And Lepresti wanted to do a monster book where Sludge is basically King Kong, Godzilla, Man Thing, Swamp right. Thing, whatever. And so you put you put those two opposing viewpoints in a room together and you know, if the, you, you either get a fight or you get some good comics. And, and it was good comics. There's also also that uh there was a plug issue too, right? A red Christmas. Red Christmas, yeah. 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 Oh That's my god. Dave. That's oh my God! We we got a chance to put Plug and, and Gerber back together again to do Sludge. I I I I couldn't move fast enough or pay them enough. It was oh my God! It made me so happy because yeah. I, I yeah Dave Dave was a Plug advocate from the very beginning, and I think you would you wanted to get Sludge cover and basically you wanted to get anything from Mike Plug that you possibly could, whether it was just a Sludge cover or a trading card or whatever. And yeah. then the then the opportunity. And I forgot how I, I, my memory is that Gerber just said, "Oh, I could call him." Yeah, no, I think that's what happened. I think I think Gerber like op opened all the doors and almost right. made the whole deal. Right, like, and then there wasn't then any negotiating. It was just like, right. I'll call, I'll call Mike, and we'll see what he, we'll see yeah. what his schedule will allow for. And then, okay. and then, and then there's that conversation with Gerber that goes like, well, why didn't you say that six months ago? <laughs> <laughs> and in typical Steve fashion, he didn't know the answer to that question. Right. That's, that's, that sounds about right. All right, next slide. The Solution, another Hudnall book. And I, I actually like the art on this one. That's yeah. Derek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good reason to like the art on that one. Yeah, we we got Derek early and put him on a bunch of late books. So all of his stuff came out at once at the end. It was It was pretty, it was pretty cool. <laughs> All right. He was he was he was great to work with though. He's fast yeah. and he's smart and he's good. Yeah, it's very 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 good to work with. And then there's Nightman. And he did Nightman too. Yeah. And Nightman uh, was a cool book. And how quickly did the TV series deal come together? It, it felt late to me, but um, you know, my I I sense think of time is weird. I think the deal came together fairly fast, but it took a long time for the show to get on the air. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it so it's because making the deal is not actually the show. Somebody still has to sell the show, hire the crew, make the show and put it on the air. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, it just it takes it takes a lot longer than anybody anybody realizes. OK. Next. The Yay! We coming. got George Perez. Yeah. What, what better? What better way to do our first real big crossover? <laughs> yep. Who are so, you get, who are you gonna get when we get all of your heroes together in one book? Oh, I know. Let's get George. George yep. said, yeah, George, "George said yes." You're kidding. That's sort of how it went. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Did that one? Did that and one? That was, did Hank, that, one? that was Hank. Hank Canals was really good friends with George, and that's how that happened. That how it happened? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yes. that's, and then, my, that's my memory of it anyway. It was Hank. Mine, Hank, mine too. Yeah. And yeah. then I think, yeah, it's pretty incredible uh, Jeff Johnson work on Solitaire. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Agree. But the, the, great, the great thing about that is um, I know Jeff gets a lot of credit for it, but you got to give credit to Barb Kahlberg on the inks. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. she really, a great job. she really made his pencils just pop. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really good point. I think that you could say that um, he's definitely a few years from being the Jeff Johnson he'd become. And yet, right. yet the stuff that she worked over him, I think that's pretty clear. And if you look at the first six issues, it's actually a scene. Yeah. 
he jumps off the building, lands, gets on a motorcycle, and rides past something. I was said the covers, right? The covers, yeah. the covers are actually a sequential scene. That's yes. great. Put side by side. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right, this is just a quick look at the li- uh, number of the creators. Yeah, it's not even comprehensive. It's just what I could come up with. And it's pretty great. It's and really amazing. You Boris, look at Boris, it. Boris, Boris Vallejo, Steve Rude. Mm-hmm. And, and before and we Jerry. started, we were talking about what a great job John Statema did on, like, what, 12 issues of The Solution or something? Oh, and, yeah. and yet, you, of course, we mentioned we mentioned Chaikin. Uh, we mentioned D- D- Dave Dorman, but you also got you got Dave Givens, Gene Ha. Uh, and I think also, uh, I don't remember what Craig Russell did. Trading I, card. Yeah, he, ah, did, some, he, right. he, just, he did some trading cards and he did some character designs. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Speaking of, and I trading still have cards. mine. I have my trading cards still. So. Yeah. Do you have all three? Do you have all the chase cards? I'm not sure what I have, but I definitely have a lot of <laughs> a lot of the trading cards. All right. That's great. We did two sets, three sets, two sets. Three sets. Up. But no three pogs. Sets. No yeah. pogs. No pogs. No. That was that was uh, Dan Danko and uh, George White from Skybox who put the cards together. Yep. Awesome. Mm-hmm. A great job on those. Here's a question. Here's a question about the slide from Firearm. Why did they let me in the movie? Exactly. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for that. Because <laughs> Dave was the producer, so that's, you like, a hundred, that's, like, a, that's like a hundred. That's like a hundred pounds ago. What did, what, did, what did producers produce? Relatives. That's right. Um, <laughs> so that's great. I I actually, you know, it was cool you did it, but the Ultra Force uh, Ultra Force cartoon actually got some traction. I uh, really you, like you, that. You can still find it uh, yeah. you know, on YouTube and a bunch of other sources. It's out there. You can go back and watch it. What channel did that air on? It was, was syndicated. Fox? It was, was it sort Fox of a, Kids. And well, I'm not sure because it might have been on the Fox Kids network, but it was syndicated by a company called Bobot, mm-hmm. and it was sort of, it was sort of at the tag end of the syndicated animated TV shows before mm-hmm. everything sort of split off, and so and it was financed by. Um, but this is actually the thing that Scott does the best: is in order to make a show like this. You have to have toys, and if you have toys, you can get a network interested. And if you have a network interested, then you can get an animation studio to right. to participate. And so, what Scott did is he just he made various trips to each one, and he would just say, once he found out that that's how the deal works, he he would basically just sort of stretch the truth a little bit and say, okay, I've got the toy people in, and then okay, we agreed to distribute it, and then he'd go back to the toy people and say, okay, they're going to distribute it, and the toy people would say, okay, we're in. And then he would go to the animation studio and say, look, I've got a network and, a, and the toy company in. And so he would. it's this weird chess game that you have to play to get everybody deal, on board to actually make the show. Deal making as a game of chicken, basically. Yes. Is what it yeah. amounts to. <laughs> All right. Do we have, this, do we have the toys next? Is that, that uh, we got the video there? game. Oh, yeah. So was, was Prime the only video game or do you guys do more? We did more, okay. but not in the Ultraverse. Okay. Yeah, and we, we were working on more ultra stuff, uh, but then you know things things happen. We were all one organization, so we had a we had a Malibu video game department as well, our vet, uh, separate company that mm-hmm. was doing these games. That was the original idea, and we had a deal with um, with a, uh, HQ Toy uh, THQ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to the distribute I, all. The idea was basically that we would sell a video game company the license to make a video game, and then part of that deal would be they would then have to hire our own video game division to make the game. Got it. And so everything sort of stayed in house. And also we had, we had control because the video game division was actually just across the hall. So if they wanted to talk to the creator of prime or they wanted to talk to the editor on prime, or they wanted to see some artwork, they could just, we just meet in the hallway. Great. Good. Okay. And of course we talked about nightman TV series already, but any, any, uh, uh, thing for me, uh, it appears that if we judge by the posts on the Facebook page, that uh, pursuing the Ultra Force toys is, is a uh, pretty active hobby at this point. Yeah, well, well, they're, they're it. legitimate collectibles at this point, right? I, ha- I oh, have yeah. some hanging on my wall and in my closet, but uh, you know, me too. For all my eBay. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was another thing I that was. I don't dare tell my wife. <laughs> well, that was that was another thing that was. Uh, run by Hank Canals. He was responsible for the toys. And so he would 
what would happen is that the, the toy company would send the modeling down to us because um, there's no internet back in those days. So they have to actually send the physical model. And then Hank, mm -hmm. because a lot of the creators were uh, local. So mm -hmm. Mike, Mike Barr could come up, Engelhart might come down, uh, or uh, Hudnall might come up, and they could actually see the model of their character. And then you'd give notes and give it back to the toy company. So everybody got involved as they could. And then Hank was the guy who trafficked everything. And, yeah. that, ex and that experience for Hank was instrumental in him getting his first job at Warner Brothers after Malibu deceased. That's wow, right. Okay. Because cool. he went immediately from Malibu to like approving and, Warner and trafficking Warner Brothers toys for like Warner Brothers licensing. Yes. Mm -hmm. I and, believe now that's and, and now he's climbed the corporate ladder mm -hmm. and he's a big wig at DC now, which is yeah. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now did the toy line did that debut with the animated series? Oh yes, it has as to. Close yeah. as, possible, yeah. as close as possible, yeah. Close as possible. Did it did the toy line continue after the animated series? Nope. No. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> nope. Nope. Because because there's no show. If the okay. the we've always heard that the show was greenlit for a second season. And that uh I think Scott tells the story that but that Marvel did not want to do a second season. And so uh, that okay. killed that killed the toy line and that killed the show. That's a shame. Such a good cartoon. Yep. I liked it growing up. All right. So we get into Marvel meets Malibu. Um, was this strictly growing out of the acquisition or was it something that was happening uh, oh, already? It was acquisition. Out of the acquisition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, except I can say that there was definitely meetings at conventions where I met with various people on staff at marvel people who could suggest stuff not people that could pull the trigger about doing an ultraverse malibu uh, ultraverse marvel crossover that's guzzo that's yeah, guzzo yeah very guzzo mm -hmm. so there were there were discussions that just never happened and then of course the you know the industry started circling the drain and everybody was running for cover gary and gary and gary and don guzzo to the great people in comics man yeah. undoubtedly so so the acquisition happens, but it almost went the other direction, right? It was almost yes. DC. Yeah, it was, it was very, 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 very close to DC. Yeah, I talked to I talked to their legal counsel every day or every other day for two or three months. Yeah, DC had been negotiating to buy it since just after WonderCon of '94. That's correct. Yes, and and DC spent a lot. Yeah, DC spent a lot of time from that through the summer. And by the time San Diego 94 came around, it looked like it was going to be a done deal with DC. So much so that we'd already started, we had taken some Malibu employees off site and already started planning DC crossovers post DC mm -hmm. acquisition. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we'd actually drawn up a proposal to send to DC once the merger actually happened. DC never saw it, but we had a proposal already in hand. Chris, mm -hmm. as Chris, as editor, as a guy trying to traffic the books and keep things going while you've got all this uncertainty over your head, <laughs> was that was that difficult to do, or was that just sort of business as usual because it's chaotic? I think for for me, for my weird career, it's been business as usual. That's always been the way it's been. That, that, that there's stuff swirling around, and, and there wasn't that level of uncertainty. But at the at the end of the day, we had to keep myself and the editors and the team had to kind of keep things just rolling. Um, as long as we're going, but at that time the industry was starting to sicken too. Uh, demand was going down, and it was a, it was becoming a rougher place for almost everyone. Sure. Uh, so uh, you know there was also a sense of well, we do need to get bigger. We need to get much smaller or get bigger. And DC would, would have been a good place to land, and then Marvel got in the mix too, and sort of like for a brief window of time, Malibu had both companies actively interested in picking us up right Which i was felt a, like alan davis crazy yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> except i was wearing pants that's yeah. <laughs> which we all appreciate <laughs> now if you don't mind me asking in like a, in a perfect world scenario with, with one of these deals going down would uh would malibu still exist as a publishing company owned <laughs> by dc or marvel or were you gonna were the characters and stuff going to get eventually absorbed into uh dc or marvel I don't, totally a, I, I don't think there was an editorial discussion that influenced the business at all. Mm -hmm. 
the business was just the business, and then they were, the business guys were going to let the editorial guys figure it out. But I, I think- like to speculate that if we'd have gone with DC, we'd have ended it up basically the way the Wildstorm universe has ended up. Mm-hmm. I also think okay. that uh, that 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 DC had a, already had a West Coast, you know, presence because of Warner Brothers, and mm-hmm. I think them having a studio that was out here would have been very useful for them uh, for doing uh, licensed books and other kinds of things. So we would have fit probably better into DC's overall plans uh, than Marvel's plans. I think Marvel, yeah. I, I get the sense, really just wanted to take us off the table more than uh, more than DC wanted to. DC wanted yeah. to integrate us, I think. Well, yeah. And because Chris and I had a had a meeting with Paul at San Diego in 94 and Paul actually said as much. He said that he's got um, a lot of people on, he's got a lot of opportunities through Warner brothers to do different kinds of books, but his team in New York that does DC comics is not interested. And it's not a negative about them. It's just that a lot of them grew up wanting to work on Batman, Superman and Supergirl. And they don't suddenly want to work for a DC that's doing video game comics out on the West coast. Right, and but we so, would have been perfect for that. Right, and we just we didn't have that uh, 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 sticking point, and sure. so uh, Paul saw us as a way to expand Warner business um, out on the West Coast while still keeping DC Comics focused on Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. And he would, yeah, he was very. What Paul liked is how nimble we were, how fast we were how we could do stuff and how we had all these crazy ideas that we could actually make happen. And he said that he was interested in seeing the kind of stuff that we would do post ultraverse. Like what, mm-hmm. what do we come up with next? We were also more yeah. techno tech, technologically advanced than either Marvel or DC. We had our own in-house yeah. digital coloring system that was working. Um, we had, you know, very literate, the entire company is very literate in terms of being connected and using email and using stuff uh, very yeah. early on that mm-hmm. just didn't happen anywhere else. We were output. We were outputting our own printer's film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's we were it's creating it's the film to send to the printer. We weren't sending pages to the printer and having them create the film before printing. We went the, the computer on the side first, of it. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, on the the first Marvel meeting that we went to in New York, the three of us show up. And we've got our computer bags with us, and all three of us pull out identical laptops and put them on the table. And the Marvel guys are like Indiana Jones discovering the Lost Ark. They're looking <laughs> at this stuff like, how do you how do you get those? What is that thing? And we right. found out that the Marvel guys had one computer, and you one had Mac to, Plus, one Mac a, Plus, and you requisitioned it for the day, and you had to put in. It, it was on it, a rolling just, cart. Yeah, right. rolling cart, and they would roll it wow. down the office. They roll had, it they to still, your office for the day, and then you'd have to roll it back to the inventory guy, the computer guy, and then he'd roll it to the next office the next morning. Right. <laughs> and, and we just carried it around like <laughs> they were sandwiches. And so it was, it's like it, they were in school signing out something from the library. Yeah, but yeah, we yeah. would have been eight, eight years of having everybody on the desk, uh, right. every person yeah. in the office having a computer on their desk. And then we would go, they would ask for some sort of information, and Dave or Chris or I would go, okay, I'll check back at the office, and I'll get you, a, you know, the, well, the phone's over there, and like, I don't need a phone. I'll just, and we would just, we would email back to the office through some sort of um, what was then the the stupid Ethernet cable thing, and the, somebody in the office would answer back right away, and they were shocked by that too. That you could just, you know, how does email work? Yeah, I remember <laughs> the first server, email. Server was the first person to ever send me a compressed file. Right. Yeah. yeah he was. He was really technically savvy. He was. Oh yeah. Yeah. And from so. Marvel, and from Marvel's point of view. It, they didn't forget the lessons learned from Image, which was if when Image joined Malibu, Malibu's Malibu's market share ju- jumped past DC into the number two slot. And Marvel was not, nobody at Marvel in the money side was going to tolerate a headline in the mass media that says DC passes Marvel as the number one publisher, even if it was only for a month. And Malibu's market share could have done that. We would have done that. Yeah. So, all right. So, the Ultraverse is sold to Marvel. There's some books put out. There's some crossover stuff. Godwheel, other things like that. It's not like you guys suddenly stop being creative. But then, then the end comes. How did uh, it? How did it arrive for each of you? Dave, you want to go first? Well, I, I kept getting shuffled around. So at, at one point, somebody from Marvel called up and said, well, Marvel doesn't need a publisher. 
So, and at that point, they didn't have a head person that was called publisher. So clearly, our lackeys in California don't need a publisher. So now you're going to go, well, Tom and I got roped into doing the whole road show for Heroes World when Marvel bought Heroes World. So we were on a we were on separate junket planes flying all over the country trying to convince retailers that the Heroes World thing was going to be a good deal. Um, and then after that, um, I got the ultimate um, compliment. They uh, gave me a title of Director of Special Projects, and I never heard from them again. <laughs> and that lasted a few months until they let me go with Severance. Mm -hmm. Tom, how about you? Oh, geez. All right. Well, I got to name names then. Um, so um, we had just Marvel was on its way down towards bankruptcy at the time, too. And they had just had a lot of layoffs from their own staff. And so and, and a lot of book cutbacks and a lot of creators. Been like, no. um, and uh, Chris and I met with uh, uh, Gino Ski, Jim Sokolowski. When he was at Marvel, we met with him. And it was basically uh, one of several meetings about how to keep the Ultraverse alive as the market crashed, as sales crashed, as retailers went out of business. You know, what does the new, what does the Ultraverse look like in that scenario? How do we, and it was always about paring down the Ultraverse and it was always about, um, you know, making Malibu smaller. And uh, and there was no money anymore to do anything new, anything fun, anything experimental, any any crazy stuff. That was all off the table. Um, and that was just, uh, well, A, that was sad to hear because, you know, the Ultraverse is just going to get smaller until it is gone. And by extension, then I'll be gone. Because you don't, if you're not publishing any books, you certainly don't need me sticking around. Right. Um, and so uh, I didn't want to stick around and sort of watch this thing that I had been a part of for so long just sort of die. Right. It's like it's like it's like watching your favorite relative where you're just sitting in the hospital all day. Uh, and so no, I didn't want to do that. Um, and then there was a conversation that we had uh, at dinner with Terry Stewart. Um, and, um, well, I'm sort of hesitant to say this, but I, Terry made it clear that uh, he was in charge. Um, in that uh, things were gonna be done his way from now on. And that's, uh, that's really uncomfortable to hear. Yeah. And so, uh, because, Terry is not a comic book guy. And more importantly, Terry was not a Malibu guy. And, um, and so less than three years ago, the image guys had handed Terry his head. Right. So he was and, sensitive about who was actually in charge. Right. And so um, it was it was clear that it was going to be time to go. And I did not yeah. I didn't I did not want to get fired from a thing I helped create. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. We, we did what founders do, which is that you realize that you, you build something and you build a culture up and you build sort of this whole life life up for yourself. It becomes the company is you. You are the company. And then you sell. And everybody who sells always thinks, oh, you know, they're going to let me do what I want to do. And now I got the money and the support. And that's not whatever happens, right? And that's why most founders leave their companies because after two years, usually, because that's how long they're contracted to stay, they leave. And yeah. I've done it. I've done it now five or six times in my my in my silly career. But this was the first time, and it hurt the most because Malibu was something that I just didn't have any perspective on that on how business worked or how real businesses work or how you know fiefdoms work and politics and all that stuff because we didn't really have a lot of that at Malibu. The politics right. we had was sort of like a a family of brothers that punch each other in the head a lot. Right. It they wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know that kind of like undermining, uh, you know, cloak and dagger stuff that you get once you belong to part of a bigger company. Yeah. The, and, the great uh, thing about the great thing about Malibu and the great thing about Scott is that he gave us all this rope where we could do stupid stuff, and right. some of it some of it failed miserably, but the repercussions of that were just well, okay, well let's a let's not do that again, and b uh, let's you know let's let's see if we can fix it. It was never, you know. Nobody ever lost their job. Nobody ever got yelled at. Nobody ever got, you know, 
call that. We might we might call it back a couple of months later. And, <laughs> and, 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 you think? And, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and right. and joked about it endlessly, but it was never, you know, it was All never right. corporate that way. So yeah. just to to sort of wind things up, Ultraverse okay. ends. Things are never going to be heard from again. And various stuff has been said about why it can't come up. But then all of a sudden we get the Rune Hero Clicks figure. Yeah. How does that yeah, happen? What's that all about? I, I have the- no idea. And then, and then you get Topaz appearing in, uh, in Thor Ragnarok. Thor, Thor Ragnarok, that's right. yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes. you know, we can we can debate endlessly about whether that's our Topaz or just somebody named that. But to me, it's pretty clear. Right. Yeah. So there's no argument about Rune. That's clearly yeah. what that is. There's, yeah. Yeah. And, there's and, no and, ambiguity there. And, right. and, it, and, it, and it is one of those things that gives us hope. So, at any rate. Uh, any final thoughts looking back at the Ultraverse from each of you? Is, is, is there anybody that doesn't think the Rune Hero Clicks wasn't just a, a, a slip, a mistake, something that wouldn't have happened if the, the right people would have known about it? Yeah, I think they I think they thought they had all the rights for it and they just went for it because it, it was a Marvel well, comic. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll say the definitive thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Of course you will. Shut you, up, guys, you guys, you guys argue. You guys argue about your little mini figures or whatever. Uh, I'll I'll make the corporate statement. No, I, think, I think I think that at the end of the day, that the Ultraverse itself is in uh, as good a hands now as they can be by being at Disney. I don't think there's another corporate partner that could hold on to them that has a chance of reviving them other than Disney. It's, your choices are Sony or Paramount or whomever and or some kind of venture capitalist group that you know dies by the stock market. Disney has a track record of holding on to IP for a great lengths of time and bringing it back when they're damn good and ready. And, um, um, and they, they, you can argue about how well they take care of something, but from a corporate standpoint, they do take care of stuff. They do revive it. They do bring stuff back. And, um, you know, so I, they may not come back in my lifetime. They may not come back in my kid's lifetime, but they exist. And Disney, Disney has them. Disney is inarguably, um, you can point at all their mistakes and everything else like that, but Disney is inarguably good stewards of their intellectual property. Yes. They and, are. and, and I think that your point is really well taken, Tom. And, I just, in, in wrapping up here, I just want to thank you guys both for the original creation of the Ultraverse, which turned me from a fan into a professional, and I'll never forget that. But also for, you know, the, the fun and friendship over the years uh, and for doing this, our first panel here on Pop XP. Yeah. And Niall, did you have anything you wanted to add? I Is Niall wanted- still here? I'm still here. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying I, I just it. hope we didn't put. I just hope we didn't put anybody to sleep. No, That's I've, right. I've yeah. learned to sleep with my eyes open and make subtle movements. Um, <laughs> okay. right. uh, no, this, was, this was great, informative. I mean, again, I grew up reading uh, your guys' comics. Um, you know, I have them over in what I call my vault, and uh, you know, it's it's great to hear the story. You know, it's great to to actually listen to the founders, the men who put it all together. And uh, more than that, I'm just I'm excited. With with our new venture and, and and with our channel and what we're doing, and to have you guys as our first panel, um, it's it's inspiring what you guys have done, and you know I really hope uh, you guys will come back on and do a, even like a follow up to this panel with like a live Q and A with the with the Ultraverse fans. Well, we have a lot more bitchy things to say, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we can go around too. Yeah, you, know, we're, you, you know. notice you notice we scheduled for an hour. Here we are, just over two. And, wow. no, and nobody's and nobody's lacking for things to say. And, I'm like, and, literally looking at the clock, going, "We're windbags." So. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and also this is as as Jeff and Chris and Dave can attest. This is actually no different from a lunch that we've had together. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this, this, this is lunch at, at every this, San Diego con for the last right. ten years. Yeah, this yeah. this is really what it's like when we get together all the time. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate yes. it, and 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 I think I think the fans will too. And uh, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Hey, Thanks, you guys, guys too. Thanks for having us on Pop XP. It's a it's a cool thing. Thanks. Yeah. All yes. right. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Take care. Take care, guys.